proffer, it would just be, let's get to the heart of, was he there and why was he there? All right, back to courtroom 5D. As you're getting ready, I'm going to ask you my questions, and if your answer is yes to any of the questions, please raise your hand. During the overnight recess, did any of you have any discussions amongst yourselves or with anybody else about the case? No hands are being raised. Did any of you read or listen to any radio, television, or newspaper reports about the case? No hands are being raised. Did any of you read um, or uh, create any emails, text messages, tweets, blogs, social networking pages about the case? Did any of you use any type of an electronic device to get on the internet to do independent research about the case, people, places, things, or terminology? Okay, thank you very much. And um, Juror E6, if you need to leave the courtroom, just raise your hand and we'll allow you to do that. We'll take a recess. Okay, thank you. Uh, with that, um, Mr. O'Mara, if you'll call That's your next witness. Um, defense would call Dennis Root, R-O-O-T. Affirm that your testimony in these proceedings will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you, God? I do. Thank you. You may inquire. Thank you. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, state your name, please. Dennis Root. Did you just spell your last name? R O O T as in Tom. And uh, tell the jury, if you would, your occupation. I'm currently self-employed as a safety and law enforcement trainer and also as a private investigator and expert witness. Okay. And it, it is that purpose that brings you here today, correct? Yes. What I'd like you to do, if you would, is to begin, I guess, at the beginning and um, tell us how you first got involved in law enforcement generally and we'll sort of walk you through the steps of your career. Okay, in April of 2011 I retired after completing just over 22 years of law enforcement service. I began my law enforcement career with the city of Riviera Beach. While employed there I performed duties primarily for road patrol. I was also offered the opportunity to obtain an instructor certification for defensive tactics which is the lead um, instructor's position for force-related hand-to-hand type training. I went to subsequent training courses for OC, which is a pepper spray training, and also impact weapons. And I managed to become the lead instructor for defensive tactics with the city of Riviera Beach while I was employed there. And so if I might, um, I'm, I know some of the terms from having spoken to you before and my experience doing this, but I'm not, I want to make sure that we that the jury understands when we use terms like impact weapons. So oh, sure. if you could, as you go through it, I may interrupt you once or twice more along the way, but if you can advise the jury what you mean and sort of the, the science behind impact weapons. Sure. Uh, for the impact weapons, we're talking about the batons. The, anything from a side handle baton to what's most commonly carried now, which is an expandable or collapsible baton, the ASP type baton. And they range from anything from a metal baton to wooden baton. So impact weapon is geared toward those weapon systems designed specifically for striking and blocking purposes. And are there particular ways uh, to actually use those weapons as opposed to just striking somebody with it? Or how does, how does a lay person know the basis for your training and how to use a weapon like that? For an impact weapon, um, for all the weapon systems in law enforcement, there are basic, what they call basic operator certification courses that are taught to law enforcement professionals. These courses are designed to teach them the laws surrounding the use of the weapon system. They're designed to educate them on how to carry, present, and also utilize, whether it's striking or blocking, or some of the weapon systems and some of the techniques that they teach can be used for takedowns and things like that. The idea behind the basic operator certification is to educate the operator on target areas, what you can expect injury-wise from a variety of target areas, um, strikes to muscle mass versus connective tissue versus what we would call deadly force or final targets, which would result in great bodily harm or death. 
So the education course, the basic operator course, is designed to educate the operator through a minimum of usually about a four-hour class on how to properly utilize the weapon for defensive and offensive needs. Okay. And I think that you had said that you had gotten a level of proficiency in that that allowed you to train other officers? Yes. I went and became an instructor. Then I eventually became an instructor trainer. And after completing my career in law enforcement, I designed and implemented also an instructor level course that I've taught um, throughout the state of Florida and various other states in the United States where I now teach the instructor of the instructors. I do the what they call a master level trainer where I do the instructor's course so that the instructors can go out and teach other trainers. I'm going to try and keep this chronological and then identify what certifications you got along the way. So you were speaking to us now about your initial law enforcement um, career beginning with Riviera Beach. Yes, sir. What else did you learn or what other proficiencies did you acquire during that work? While there, like I said, I became a defensive tactics instructor. I went to the required state course for gaining certification to teach open hand control techniques. Striking, blocking, takedowns, arm locks, things like that. I also became an instructor for pepper sprays. Uh, pepper spray, again, just similar to impact weapons, has a basic operator certification course. And I went to the trainer's course to teach the basic course. Uh, that course involves proper deployment, target areas, and so forth. In a similar nature as you do with the impact weapons, it's just a, a lower level on the force continuum that's evaluated by those being either using it or evaluating its use. So my instructor certifications, while at the city of Riviera Beach, were the initial instructor level courses. You had mentioned a term that I presume is going to come up in your future testimony here today, so I want to ask you to explain it to the jury, a, a concept of a force continuum. Does that, is that, explain to the jury what that is. It's basically, a force continuum is a systematic approach to the escalation and de-escalation of force options. It's basically looking at an event and saying that all events start, for example, with somebody being present. So that would be one of the first things that you would look for as you begin your evaluation. Who was there, how many were there, so on and so forth. You evaluate each and every level, and you have to break it down for both the aggressor and you have to break it down. In law enforcement terms, it's the, the aggressor or your, your subject and the officer. In civilian terms, it would be the aggressor and the defender. Okay, And what you do is you look at the various levels of options that are available to that individual, taking into consideration a wide variety of topics, ranging from personal information, subject factors like their age, their height, their weight, things like that, moving through background, training, experience, weapon availability, environment considerations. All these things come into a force continuum, which is a structured way of saying that if um, I were to do A, you would be permitted to do B. And it's a structured system that allows to evaluate where the one person is on a force level in comparison to where the other person is permitted to be or is what they really term to be accepted to be at. And is that then information that you both learned as a law enforcement officer and now teach? Yes. I started, the first time you take a force course, one of the first topics they go over is the law and the force continuums because without a thorough understanding of how and when you can do something, it's, there's no need to move any farther into weapon systems and what you could utilize for that. So it's a really basic foundation that everything else comes from. And when you progress it through law enforcement, the options are quite different because there's so many things in what, what I call the bat belt. You know, a police officer has gear wrapped around them from pepper spray, tasers, impact weapons, firearms. The average person doesn't. So the continuum, even though it can be taken down and looked at through other perspectives, legal means and so forth for an individual, the essence of the continuum remains the same. It's just the availability of options changes. And um, was this something, where does this training begin? Is this what you learn as a, a rookie, they call it, or a plebe, somebody in the academy? Or? Um, the training on force begins in the police academy. It's one of the, what they call high liability courses that an officer must demonstrate proficiency in in order to obtain and be able to test to obtain their law enforcement certification. So it is one of the key base building blocks that starts 
in the police academy and never ends. Law enforcement agencies everywhere are required to maintain an ongoing level of training on all the various weapon systems as well as communications because that's also considered a, a component of use of force. Though all the things that an officer could utilize during their career, they have to maintain a level of proficiency and that training never ends until the day that they walk out of their career. And we were now talking in our timeline about your work at Riviera Beach. You've talked now about some of the certifications, if you would continue with those. Um, the, the other certifications that I went to, I, I was very into traffic. So in Riviera, I became uh, the, basically the on-shift traffic unit. We had a small shift and we didn't have an active traffic unit. And I became involved with teaching DUI as well. So one of my other certifications, I became a certified with DUI stops and things, and actually created a training program for the city of Riviera Beach that was approved through the state attorney's office on how to conduct a DUI investigation and how to properly document it throughout the entire DUI process. In the, uh, how long were you with Riviera Beach? Total about five years. Okay. And um, any other specialties or training focuses that you had with Riviera besides those that you've mentioned so far? The only other things that really became certifications is while I was there, I did attend conferences geared toward defensive tactics. Um, when I took my first instructor certification course in defensive tactics, I kind of fell in love with the topic and knew right then and there that that was something I wanted to do and specialize in for the rest of my career, if not longer. And I went and became a, an instructor for various techniques like um, vascular restraints, uh, a lot of people call them chokeholds. They're not really chokeholds, but for layman terms, the police apply chokehold, for lack of better terms. Um, also, in control points, which are the pressure points on the human body, I became a certified instructor with that. And I also became a certified instructor in, at the time, it was called ink pen knife defenses. And what that was, be, the most common thing a police officer has on their person is an ink pen. And when confronted with an adversary, if you were utilizing your pen, it's a way to utilize the ink pen in defensive measures against somebody that may have a knife or other edged object and you are not able to transition to your firearm. It was techniques to utilize that to defend yourself. Now moving forward from Riviera Beach, first, any other certifications we haven't talked about yet during those, that first sort of chapter of your career? No, that was, that was pretty much it there. <laughs> And uh, if I might, I'm going to have something marked, if I might, Your Honor. Have you uh, provided to us what we commonly know as a resume or a CV documenting some of this information? Yes. Would it be um, helpful to have this available to you as we go through your testimony? It, it could. I mean, if there was something I didn't know, but I, I mean, it's, it's my life, so I'm pretty, pretty okay. clear on it. Unless you want a specific date on an attendance of class, then I would probably have to look at my CV for that. Um, we have it marked. We'll keep it as that. If you can use your memory, that's fine as well. So let's move forward then from Riviera Beach. Um, where did you go after that? The next agency I was with for a very brief period of time was the Jupiter Police Department, where I was assigned again to row patrol duties. Okay. Any, uh, how long were you there? That was just under a year. I was, under, I was there just under a year. And during that time, I had the opportunity also to take on a lead role as a defensive tactics instructor. When I was recruited by the city of Jupiter, um, I started and immediately began being presented with opportunities to bring the skills and things that I had learned from Riviera Beach to the Jupiter Police Department. And I began um, training with some of their other lead trainers on defensive tactics techniques and various things dealing with defensive tactics. So in layman's terms then, defensive tactics is how somebody would defend themselves against somebody else. It's fighting. It's in fighting. layman's terms, is it's fighting. And fighting in a way that minimizes injury to yourself? Oh, absolutely. The reason it was initially termed defensive tactics is in law enforcement, pretty much when you utilize force, it's in response to another person's actions. So it became defensive in nature. Even though there are taught offensive techniques, the whole goal in law enforcement was you defended yourself, you defended another person, you just didn't walk up and start a fight. That's where the term came from. But the, the reality of it is you're teaching people how to defend themselves through fighting techniques. Why such a short period of time at Jupiter PD? Um, 
when I started there in Riviera, because it was a very active city in Riviera Beach, I didn't spend any time on midnights. I actually was pretty much always on 3 to 11 the afternoon, you know, the evening shift where it was really, really busy. When I went to Jupiter, they had a seniority basis, and you had to be on midnights until you were there long enough that your seniority allowed you to leave that shift. Unfortunately for me, I learned while I was there is I have, a, for lack of better words, a condition that doesn't allow my body clock to change, so I couldn't adapt to midnights. I literally would sleep an hour and a half to three hours tops in a day, and it was really affecting me. So I went to the administration, told them about it. Normally, because you're on probation, they would just terminate you because you can't perform the job the way they want it done. I was blessed that they extended me the opportunity to move immediately to a 4 to a four to 12 shift, which created a lot of strife in my career because there were a lot more senior people ahead of me that should have been given that position, but the administration elected to offer it to me. And because of the conflict that it created, it just seemed like a better idea that other options were presented to me, and I felt that it would be a good idea to follow them. And just to clear up any concerns anyone may have, was the short duration of your time with Jupiter due to any disciplinary problems, any concerns, or any performance evaluation issues? None, not, none whatsoever. Then you went from Jupiter to where? Uh, Martin County Sheriff's Office. I took a position as a drill instructor with the Juvenile Offender Training Center, their juvenile boot camp. It was under law enforcement special services, and it was a really unique opportunity to work with kids. And what do you do during that part of your career? The time that I was assigned to the Juvenile Offender Training Center, I started as a drill instructor in the boot camp. and. Because of my background and experience, within a short period of time, I was asked to take over the training responsibilities for the program, where I helped develop training programs for ongoing training for new drill instructors and the current staff. Eventually, I was given the responsibility of being the supervisor of what they termed the Sanctions Enforcement Unit, which is the equivalent of probation officers. When the young men come in through the system, by the time that they're there after about six months, they're released back into the community where they're monitored by deputies to ensure that they're transitioning, maintaining their curfew, and doing things like that. So it would be equated to as similar as being a probation officer for a juvenile offender. Um, and then I was promoted to the rank of sergeant and ran that unit until I um, went back to road patrol and pursued other opportunities for me within the sheriff's office. During the time you were with the sheriff's office, did you um, accomplish any other certifications or training uh, in particular areas of law enforcement focus? My focus, I had the opportunity to experience just about everything a police officer can experience while with Martin County. I was within their training unit, I was within their criminal investigations division as a detective, I was in the traffic unit, road patrol, I also served um, on the canine unit, and Throughout my time, the entire process, I also was an ancillary instructor where I would go and take on and do training classes for a variety of topics, mostly dealing with force. I continued my education. I continued going to schools. I also became a master instructor. First became an instructor and then a master instructor with Taser International, which is the, uh, the taser weapons, the stun guns. And then I started transitioning and teaching the instructor level courses for that. I also took over when I was in training, I was designated the use of force specialist in the agency where anytime there was a force event, the information was always forwarded to training. My job was to look at it, evaluate it, see if there were violations of either policy and procedure or training standards. And also I would try to take the experiences of the other deputies who were involved in various issues and see how we could turn them into training opportunities for the deputies that never experienced it but may benefit from the experience. So throughout the remaining portion of my career, I dedicated most of my time to continuing my training and development of certifications in force-related topics. I went, got my firearms instructor certification. I also became a tactical shotgun instructor. I continued on and uh, became an instructor trainer with pepper sprays. So I'm transitioned from where I had the instructor rating up to the instructor class where I could teach the instructor courses. And I continued, I also took on responsibility at the uh, local academy where I was a, at first started as an adjunct trainer for the academy for corrections and law enforcement teaching defensive tactics. I was lucky enough that my teacher and mentor was stepping down 
and provided me with the opportunity to step up to what they call the lead instructor's position, which is the person who coordinates and organizes the law enforcement and corrections academies defensive tactics programs. In the process, I also obtained my two-year degree in criminal justice, which enabled me now to start teaching the instructor level classes for the college for like defensive tactics. So I became the instructor that taught the defensive tactics instructors course. You had mentioned a moment ago about this becoming a use of force specialist. Is this something that teaches what we talked about a moment before, which was this continuum of force and how and when to use force in a law enforcement situation? Yes, as the designated use of force specialist for the agency, my job was to develop use of force training. I worked with fantastic in instructors for firearms, um, defensive tactics. I was given the privilege of coordinating a lot of the training that took place, especially if it fell to, to force of any type, whether it was handcuffing, because I took it upon myself also to go and get schools for to become a handcuffing instructor. Not just the ones that come from defensive tactics, but other disciplines and other organizations that offer that type of training, because I was always trying to find a better way to teach our personnel and other people how to stay safe and utilize the weapon systems. I throughout my career continued and went back for, we have regional trainings where I would go to acquiring additional certifications that tapped onto and added to already existing instructor certifications like tactical handgun and shotgun. Um, I also went to NRA courses where I started to attend classes to get NRA certifications for firearms training and I became a state licensed firearms instructor so that I started teaching armed security courses. I had already been teaching unarmed security training for security officers but by obtaining the state licensed firearms instructor certification it enabled me to teach the firearms aspects of security and I just continued developing training that was eventually geared toward and took over where I was presenting some of the civilian training for the sheriff's office from one of the most important jobs for law enforcement or any company is the fact of communication. So I took on the responsibility of teaching um, a program known as verbal judo, which is tactical communication, how to communicate with somebody in a way that's not aggressive. So I also added that to my responsibilities as the force specialist. And I continued to develop the training programs for the sheriff's office. When I was offered other opportunities like going to K-9 and things like that, I worked very closely with the uh, lieutenant of our training unit in continuing to develop training for the agency as a whole. Not to focus on probably the least significant of the certifications you just discussed, but there are actually proper ways to handcuff people and yes, there are techniques because you have to be handcuffing somebody is putting restraints on them. You have concerns about that because if you place them on too tightly, it can cause injury to someone. Also, if you don't properly train the individual on how to use restraints, there's a, what I call the good side and bad side to handcuffs. The good side is the side that actually moves. So when you make contact with a person, it'll ratchet around and actually move. If you use the bad side, make contact, you can cause injury because it's basically two pieces of steel that you're slamming into a wrist, so it can cause injury. So yeah, there are techniques that you should continuously revisit, even as something as small as handcuffing. Okay. You mentioned that as a use of force expert, you would sometimes use opportunities or situations as training exercises. It sounds like good speak for when another officer doesn't do something right, you help retrain them. Is that, was that part of what you did? Yes and no. I mean, it's not just when they don't do something right, it's also when they do something correctly. When you get a force event in, I, I get handed paperwork that says, basically, here's what happened. I took it upon myself. I would speak with the officers involved. I would speak with um, supervisors involved. If we determined something was wrong, then obviously we needed to re-educate that officer on how to do their job properly. But we also use that as an opportunity to make sure everybody else remembers this is the way to do it. But just as important, when an officer was involved in a situation that was just unique, that no one else up to that point had ever been involved in, we take it, we look at it at its face value, and then we try to create a training scenario that we would be able to put other deputies or officers through a similar controlled event so they gain the experience. So it's not just when they do it wrong, it's also when they're doing it right and we're adapting it to training for the agency as a whole. 
And as you then continued your experience as Martin County Sheriff, um, did you get or uh, continue a focus on those use of force events where you became the go-to person for those? I was lucky enough that throughout my career and because of my training background and experience, the agency, um, the state attorney's office, when there were force events that took place, shootings and things like that, I was the person that I was given the opportunity to evaluate, review, and provide an opinion on it. I also have been contacted by agencies surrounding us as well as across the United States because I've taught at or been with other training programs and have met a lot of people and I've had the opportunity when they've had something unique or they're developing a policy for the first time or for example like with the taser weapons when they were brand new I would get phone calls about making recommendations on how their policy and procedure should be written so that it conforms both with what the manufacturer requires for training programs but also what meets a lawful need given the use of the weapon system. So I had the opportunity to be the person that went other agencies and individuals came to um, as well as testify to grand juries um, about officer involved shootings. I've testified um, or I've, I've spoken to other agencies and counseled other personnel on proper documentation as well as techniques for use of force. Other certifications that we haven't talked about that you've accomplished through the, your time with Martin County, we've talked about some of the use of force and the particular weapon systems and you talked about defensive tactics and NRA. Uh, any other particular areas of training or focus that you had during your time with Martin County? I'm kind of unique because every time I take on a position, I try to find an instructor's course for it because I was truly in the mindset that if you learn to teach it, you can perform it a little bit better. Uh, when I, for example, when I became a canine handler, I was very vested into the position and then I became a canine team instructor. Each and every weapon system that we had from a coubaton to an impact weapon, as far a coubaton being those little key ring things that you can use for, they're like maybe six inches long plastic that you'll see on some people's key rings. Those are little impact weapons, you know, little batons. Um, up through including full length batons, knife defenses, handguns, long guns. Uh, I participate in the training of our agency for rifles. Everything, if, if it's a weapon system, I had the opportunity to provide training with it. Um, and if it was a weapon system that I was dedicated to, like vascular strands, or if it was impact, OC, taser, firearm, I went and became an instructor and eventually created, I currently have four courses that I've created myself that I travel and teach as an instructor of the instructors. And uh, aside from that specific to law enforcement, do you have any training or expertise in general physical combat, fighting, or areas that aren't specifically law enforcement but still assist you in a presentation regarding use of force? I started martial arts training when I was about 13 years old, and I became a semi-pro kickboxer. Um, I was very lucky. I got to participate in the 80s in the ISK super fights and things. Actually, it was right here in Orlando. It was my first super fight that I was able to participate in. So I've always had an interest and involvement in physical combat. Uh, I grew up with two older brothers, so I got beat up a lot by my older brothers, and it was just seemed like a reasonable thing to do for me to try to bring in that personal experience. So in the process of my own personal experiences with fighting, martial arts, kickboxing, um, training. I was actually training with uh, Chris Anderson and Rico Brockington, who were at the time, in the late 80s, they held two, they were both championship fighters, boxers. And I had the opportunity to train with them and to learn from them um, when I was attending my kickboxing schools. And I just continued on. Currently, I'm involved with a martial arts organization, and I've been given the privilege of developing and working with them in developing firearms related to martial arts, where it's a component, because a lot of people think of the samurai with the swords, which is very accurate, but believe it or not, toward the end of the samurai's era, they actually were using firearms. And it's a lot of things about the history of fighting that people don't know. And I'm, I'm blessed to work with a gentleman by the name of Dennis Ritchie that um, runs an organization dedicated to the traditional aspects. And he's trying to bring in all these components so that people can learn safety through martial arts training, the peace, the mind, the, the essence of the spirit, and take it all the way through even the modern day weapon systems that people utilize today. 
and I've been blessed with the opportunity to participate with that. Um, ever take the opportunity to even the score with your brothers? I, I did, and, but it was very young, and I lost, and I got blessed enough that as I became a police officer, my brother's also a retired police officer, but through our transition to my schooling, he started to realize, I think, that it was better just to leave me alone. So at some point, the tables turned. I could just, you know, I like to just think that he knew better. I don't know that he did, but I like to think that he did. That's good. And um, during all this time with uh, Martin County, uh, you completed your law enforcement career with Martin County, correct? Yes, I retired in April of 2011. During the last few years of your tenure with Martin County, can you advise the jury sort of even more what your focus was on assisting the county, the sheriff's office, in dealing with their use of force events? In the latter portions of my career, um, I became involved with the sheriff's office for, just like I already said, all the force training. I maintained that all the way to the very last day. Matter of fact, even after retiring, um, I was offered the opportunity with Sheriff Crowder to continue training with the agency, and um, I had accepted that opportunity to do so. Um, and during that time, I'd also started, I had permission from the Sheriff's Office to start my training company, where I started doing law enforcement training and eventually individual, or what we refer to as civilian training. And um, during that time, particularly the last few years with Martin County, did that include opportunities for you to review use of force events and to either testify on someone's behalf or to deal with the administrative side of a use of force event? Because of the area, we're, we're blessed that we don't have a lot <coughs> over the careers of, of shooting, but we, we, have had a, we have had our fair share. Toward the end of my tenure with the Sheriff's Office, I, as a use of force specialist, I was approached by the state um, to testify, to review, and provide an opinion for grand jury on use of force events involving police-involved shootings that ended up in the, the death of the subject being shot. Um, I was also brought in by our agency at the Martin County Sheriff's Office when we had organizational-involved shootings that there were times where I was brought into administrative meetings to meet with the attorneys group to do an evaluation of the use of force to determine um, whether or not I had considered it, that event at that time to be reasonable or not and to provide input as to why it was or was not. So I kind of helped the attorneys group for the sheriff's office representing them and forming an idea as to what actually took place. And I was also given the opportunity for the state to do the same thing for grand juries. And if you would, just tell us a little bit more about the experience that you've had um, with your presentation to grand juries. What, um, would you, what would you take on? What was your role? And what would you present? Obviously, we know that any particular testimony in front of a grand jury in and of itself would be confidential. So I'm not going to ask for specifics, but generally or generically, what would you do? Essentially, what happens with a grand jury is I would be given all of the evidence. I'd be given a copy of all the written reports, any radio transmission CDs of any videos, photographs, crime scene photos, everything. I would, they would, I would be given the opportunity to review all the evidence. Because as the use of force expert, your job is to evaluate it from every perspective possible. You can't just walk into an event, look at it, and say, OK, that's how it worked. Because nothing works that way. Every single person sees things differently. So I would get all of the evidence. I would be given an opportunity to review all of the evidence, formulate opinions based on my background training experience as to how I thought it went, provide an opinion as to whether I thought whatever was done was either considered to be objectively reasonable or was considered not to be objectively reasonable. Then what would happen is at a grand jury they would call all the witnesses in and I would come in and the state would ask for my opinion and I provide it to the grand jury of how, what my opinion was based on my background training and experience as to whether I thought what A, B, and C was, was it objectively reasonable given the facts and circumstances known to me with all the evidence, or was it unreasonable? On how many occasions did you have an opportunity to present such testimony to a grand jury? I believe it was six different times. Okay. May I approach the witness for a moment, Your Honor? me. It will review with you what's marked as our exhibit R, R, and can identify that. That's my curriculum vitae. There was something that you prepared both for other um, cases you've been involved in and for today? Yes. 
Is it covered, if I might, Your Honor? I think there's no objection. No objection? Correct. Okay. Um, defense Exhibit RR will come into evidence as Defense Exhibit 24. And uh, regarding your most recent testimony, concerning your testimony with the grand jury, uh, we've had a discussion about what you will and will not testify to here today, correct? Yes. As far as your focus of the Zimmerman case. So let me ask you, in that regard, um, how you and I first got together or how you became a witness in this case? I actually reached out to Mr. O'Mara um, when I saw the case unfolding, obviously like everyone else in the media, I had a, a unique interest in it because there was so much information being flooded to the media. I didn't know exactly what had happened, obviously, as no one does. And I reached out to him because I thought I had a unique perspective as to coming to a, a realistic conclusion on things. Being able to proffer and look at things and just render my background training and experience to him to see if it helped. I, my experience has been, I wanted to ensure, and the, the most common question is, you know, I reach out to a, a defense attorney for, as a police officer, or a former police officer, and the truth is, there are a lot of people that can do what I do. As a, there's plenty of experts available. And I reached out to Mr. O'Mara because it was my belief that if I reviewed the material and felt that I could be of no assistance, I would not be able, I would not do anything to hinder the progression for anybody in this case whatsoever. But if it was something that I felt that I could help with, I went to the one party that if it was an opportunity to be of assistance, I knew that I would be able to do so. So I reached out to him and to see if he had interest in using my services. Okay. And that then um, began the process for you and I began working together on this case? Yes. And if you would just advise the jury um, generally and if, if appropriate, but more specifically, what you would want available to you for review in a case like this and then what you got in this particular case. What I request is, is just like with the state and the grand juries, everything that I can. As, as a use of force expert, I have to look at it from as many perspectives as possible because everybody's perspective is different. You have to take into consideration what their upbringing was, what their background was, where they lived, what their personal life experiences were and currently are. You know, so my request is to obtain as much information as possible, get any witness statements that I can get, any photographs that I can get, all the evidence that's available so that I can help see a complete picture and not just a picture that'll be guided from one direction or another. An expert's job is merely to look at everything and evaluate it in the totality of the circumstances, not skewed by one person's opinion or another person's opinion. And in this case, then, what information did you request and what information was given? Pretty much everything that I requested um, was provided. Um, I can't think of anything that wasn't. I, I requested to be able to review the 911 calls. I requested to be able to review the reports from law enforcement, from the medical examiner's office, um, anything that was documented or written down so that I could get an insight from um, not just the witnesses that provided statements, whether it be orally or in writing, but also from the investigators that were conducting it to, so I could also look at the questions that were being asked to see. Sometimes you can think of a question you don't know, but as you go through a different investigator, they thought of the question, so seeing all the investigators' reports was very important. I also requested um, any crime scene photos that were there to try to give me an idea of what the environment was like. And everything that I requested, I, I can't think of anything that I wasn't provided with for evaluation. And um, realizing that you weren't here during the trial, I'm going to go over some quick overview of some of the information to make sure that the jury knows you may have had this specifically to the extent that they've heard testimony. So did you get witness statements that were produced pursuant to law enforcement requests? Yes, I received the written witness statements and I also had the witness statements from the interviews where they actually conducted the, the criminal investigation interview. And on the occasions that deposition transcripts were available, did you receive those as well? As far as I know, if they were available, I, I did get a chance to see them. And did you receive 
all the entirety of the police, if you will, police file or the investigative file that's prepared in this case. To the best of my knowledge, I, I've gotten everything. I, of course, you know, you don't know what you don't know, but I believe I've received everything. And I think you mentioned that you were able to review, for purposes of your testimony today, the autopsy itself concerning the injuries to Mr. Martin. Yes. And um, pictures of Mr. Martin and Mr. Zimmerman. Yes. You have an opportunity to review any of the scene mock-ups or drawings that were created uh, either by the state or defense in this case? The only scene drawings that I saw for, from what I received were from the investigators. I didn't see any, you mentioned a state mock-up, I didn't, I didn't see okay. a state mock-up. Uh, if I might approach for a moment, Your Honor. Um, as an example, uh, this is in evidence as states 139, just to see if this is just that. Did you see something, a much smaller version of this? Yes, sir, I, I did. And on 140, uh, another sort of similar mock-up of the same thing. Have you seen that? Yes, sir. Okay. When I say mock-up, I was speaking of something I like apologize. that. I apologize. Yes, I've no, seen no. those. My mistake with yours. Did you also have an opportunity to review um, video and audio and written statements from Mr. Zimmerman? Yes, I did. To your knowledge, and I know that you don't know what you don't know, but did you get the entirety of the information that you requested? As far as I know, I got everything that I was looking for. Was there anything that, we, that you asked to get from us that we said we don't want you to have or that we just didn't give you? No, quite the contrary. Um, some things came up uh, during the deposition that apparently you didn't know I didn't have, and I was given it immediately. And that may have been just some of the witness statements or some other... Um, pieces of evidence that Mr. Guy during your deposition had questioned you about? Yes, one that I'm, I'm referring to specifically was a, a, a TV interview. I had either not seen it in the, the materials or something and I was, when Mr. Guy asked me about it, I wasn't aware of it, but since then I have viewed it. Are we speaking now about the um, Sean Hannity interview? Yes, sir. For your purposes, understand that that's in evidence now. The jury has reviewed that. So as you incorporate that into your testimony, be aware that they know what, what it is you're talking about. OK. Did you get enough information in this case um, from which you could review the available information to focus your opinion regarding the events that happened that night? Yes. In the overall scheme of cases and comparing the information available to you in this case to others that you reviewed, is this less than you normally review, average, or more than you normally get a chance to review? I would say this is, this is average for the, the significance of this issue. I, I think that there was, I mean, there was a lot of material, but it's on average when you deal with an event of any similar nature, you're going to get a lot of data. We've had other experts testify, and um, within that context, they narrow their focus to their area of, of expertise, and I would ask you to do the same. Um, so if you could sort of lay the foundation for the jury, when you're looking through all of this information, all of the witness statements, all the pictures, all of whatever it is, what filter are you using to focus the information that's relevant for you and your opinion? Well, I, I focus everything based on background, training, experience, knowledge of, in, in individual or civilian realm, knowledge of the law, and all of the information. I focus it based on the totality of the circumstances known to me, and I bring in my background, training, and experience, both for law enforcement and individual. Because one of the things we didn't talk about for my background is my training company is, I now primarily do individual type training, firearms training, um, self-defense classes for um, children, adults, and seniors. So I take all of that background training and experience, and that's what I use to filter out the information. And I couple it, obviously, with over 20 years of law enforcement experience in evaluating information that's been presented and understanding how things may be affected by other people. And was that then done in this case? Absolutely. 
So what information that you had available to you assisted, well, let me back up, um, is, was your focus of your investigation of this case, in your opinion, based upon the um, event specifically surrounding the intersection of Mr. Zimmerman and Mr. Martin that night? That was the primary focus area. And the altercation that ensued and the eventual shooting? Correct. Okay. So if you would then, with that, I guess, as your filter, walk the jury through what information you looked at and then found relevant to assist you in formulating your opinions? Well, the, the first thing that I utilize is the initial statements, or I'm sorry, excuse me, the, the initial calls that come in. Um, it's really important to establish a timeline for events. The timeline is very important because it helps you understand and compartmentalize information to the best of your ability because as with any issue, perspectives are skewed. So what some people may see or hear, another person may not, doesn't mean that they didn't witness something or that they didn't know something. It just may not be from the same perspective as another witness. So the first thing that I look that and listened to were the 911 calls that came in. Then I added to that the, the initial interviews of the um, key witnesses, I use the word key witnesses, the, the people with the most information that saw or heard the most that could be relied upon. And I use... I might, I'm sorry. Yes. Just so you're aware, I know that in depositions and prior conversations with you and I and the state and you, the identity of certain witnesses was kept confidential. We were using witness names, and I think I said half a dozen times to you not to ever mention the witnesses by name. That um, restriction has been relaxed. Those witnesses' names are now available to the jury. So to the extent, I, I withdraw my request of you earlier. Okay. So to the extent that it is relevant for you to identify them by name, you may have trained yourself to just use numbers, that's okay as well, but to the extent that you can utilize the names, it would be helpful for the jury to know particularly which witness is you talked to or about, talked about or read about. Okay, that does help a little bit. Um, primary, I, I reviewed all of them and I, forgive me if I don't pronounce all their names correctly because some of the names are very difficult. Um, statements from Ms. Lauer, Mr. Good, uh, the Bahadors. The, I mean, I, I, I listened to every audio recording from the 911 calls that came in as well as from the witnesses. And I tried to filter through what each witness said and compare it to where on a timeline it could fall. You know, for example, just as, as a, a brief example, if somebody said that their attention was called to the event because they heard screaming, well, that tells me within the timeline that certain things had already taken place because the, when the screaming started. So you, you have to look at it and try the best you can to filter in the information. And then you take into consideration witnesses that actually, like Mr. Good, who actually stepped out and and had a time where he interacted from a distance with the participants. I used all of that information to begin forming my opinions and to, be, to focus in my energies on evaluating what I thought may have taken place. As, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, yeah, that's fine. As to the witnesses that you viewed, the statements and, and the information they presented to you, um, Based upon your training and experience, 20 years worth or more as law enforcement, how do you view witness statements um, and whether or not you can guarantee accuracy or not? I look at it, it it's very fluid. Accuracy is based on perspective. Um, I'm, a, I'm a movie fanatic, so there was this movie by Dennis Quaid for uh, Vantage Point and it would show one singular event from like eight different perspectives. That's the reality of most encounter every single person has, is we all have our vantage point, we all have our perspective. So as I begin to listen to the statements that are being made, when I said I listened to the 911 calls and then the initial interviews, one of the best things about the initial interviews as a person evaluating an event is the fact that you're usually getting the most raw information. In other words, that's the most immediate access information from their brain right there without any other stimulus or influence of any type. Um, one of the first things that we do as investigators is separate 
witnesses because everybody that talks, I may say that, um, if I can use Mr. O'Meara, is wearing a, a, a pink shirt and you only see it for a quick second and you thought it was like an orange shirt and I'm wrong and you're right, if I'm strong enough in my conviction, you may sway to my perception. So when I look at it and I listen to the, and I evaluate what was said, I really try to go back to the original statements that were made before there could have been any other outside variable or influence because those usually are the most raw. They may not always be the most complete, but they're the essential elements of what a person witnesses because they're usually the ones that strike the deepest inside a person's mind. So when I begin to review information, I listen to the calls, then I go to that initial interview. Um, if they have a subsequent interview, which in these cases, um, there were other interviews at other times, you can see things change a little bit. And one of the most important things is to remember, again, perspective. I, I have a thing that I, I, I call the hot pot theory. Hot pot theory. <laughs> the idea behind it is about perspective. And when I teach classes, I explain that if I took a pot and I placed it in the freezer and it got ice cold and I took it out and I placed it on your stove and you came in and I asked you to pick up the pot and move it for me, the moment you make contact with the pot and you feel that complete change in temperature, you're, you're instinctually letting go and, and moving away. And then the most people, not all, but most people will, will test the water to see because their brain took into account the environment, the event, what they perceive, what is a pot when it's on a stove usually. It's very hot. When they touch and feel that sudden change in temperature, their perception was, even though it wasn't, it was very hot because of all the external influences. So when I look at eva and evaluate statements being given, what I try to do is put myself into that person's shoes the first time they spoke. What did they see? What did they hear? What can they remember before they have any of the other influences? Because remember, even under that high stress event, they're still having influences, whether it's dark, the lighting, raining, whatever the case is, there's environmental influences. Uh, if they just had a, a discussion with a loved one that didn't go well, that's gonna influence their perceptions. You know, so you try to look at it from their perspective and merge, if you will, their perspective with the perspective of another the perspective of another coupled with physical evidence and things like that until you arrive at what you deem to be a logical conclusion. So in your experience then, if you run into a situation where there are conflicting statements about the same event, is that an understandable occurrence to you or is that evidence deceit or how do you resolve that? Conflicting statements are normal. They're also very normal from the people involved in the event. Something to remember about high stress events. A high stress event can be something like somebody driving down the road and a car coming across their lane when they didn't expect it. That was a very stressful event. Certain things happen inside the human body. You know, I, I do training classes for the psychological and physiological aspects and effects of stress on a person during combat. People that witness horrendous events go through a similar emotional response. So you have to look at it and understand that there are going to be deviations in statements because of perspective, stress. Some people don't want to acknowledge some things because there are some people that want honestly to live in a bubble and their perspective is based on they don't want to accept that certain things happen. So when I look at it and I get statements that they're conflicting, you look at the essence of the statements and you try not to get hung up, if you will, on small changes. You, now, if their entire statement changes, that creates a completely different animal. But when you talk about a person who has just a slight deviation, you look at it in the context in which it was presented and see if maybe there's been another variable that caused that deviation. As far as a, a deviation from witness to witness immediately following an event, again, that's just based on perspective. There's always gonna be those variances. So we had an opportunity to review, as you mentioned, the witness statements in this event. I focus you on Mr. Diker's event. You have an opportunity to see that or review that statement. Mr. Diker? Ms. Sir Diker. Oh, Sir Diker. The woman who thought that she heard maybe three no, no, shots. I'm sorry. I need to interpose an objection as to improper and asking this witness to comment on another witness. 
I'm not, I'm not seeking for impeachment, Your Honor. I'm actually seeking to explain. Okay. Well, listen to your next question then. Okay. Um, you read Ms. Sodiker's statement where she suggested that she thought she heard three shots? Yes. Okay. Did, did that give you any cause for concern, or is that just a perception issue that you just fit into the rest of your evaluation? Your same objection as his commenting on a witness, the testimony of another witness. I, I, my response, but I don't want to speak okay. the objection. Well, then approach. Let's go back to courtroom 5D. A moment ago about um, your review of Ms. Sudeikers' statement and the fact that she heard uh, sort of a pop, pop, pop. Um, did that cause you any concern or did that just sort of fit into the idea of what you mo mentioned a moment ago about people in certain situations, particularly if they're stressful, might um, interpret things in a certain way? It, as far as raising concern, no, it didn't raise concern. You know, as just the first thing that comes to mind when somebody talking about multiple sounds, especially with gunshots, in enclosed areas or areas that are not wide open, sound travels, reverberates. So it's not uncommon for somebody to hear one thing, and it sounds like many because of the fact that the, the sound itself is bouncing off of either buildings or alcoves or what have you. Um, also, every human being, like I said before, when we talk about distortion, we have what we call perceptual distortions. and high stress events change the manner in which we see things. Uh, you know, and I always use the law enforcement ex experiences because there are people who think they see one thing and then later on they second guess themselves. They actually saw it or maybe they saw a portion of it, but their perceptual distortion because of the high stress event, it alters the manner in which they interpret the information that they're receiving. That's a natural human response for everything. You know, when you talk about any kind of dynamic high stress event, People will experience perceptual distortions or memory issues for lack, you know, that's what a lot of people call me, well, it's a memory issue. Well, it's the way they perceived it, and sometimes it's just that stress event repeats for them, and they're trying to make the best sense of it the best that they can. So we were then talking about um, the other information and how you sort of filtered into the event that was a particular focus of yours, and that is the altercation itself. So if you would just continue through that with the jury as to the information you looked at, most particularly that you, which you perceive to be relevant for you in determining or accomplishing an opinion regarding the altercation. In the information regarding the, the specific altercation was Mr. Good's statement coupled with the 911 calls, Ms. Lauer specifically, which really had, from what I've reviewed, the most clear, for lack of better words, information for the background involved in what was taking place in the event, um, coupled with the, the photographs of Mr. Zimmerman's injuries. I utilized those calls, those statements, those injuries, and then uh, you have to be able to match things up. You try to look at it and bring it into perspective and say, does this lead to this? Do, do these make sense? Are they within the realm of one another? You know, when you, you talk about somebody involved in a physical altercation, you know, whether it's, I have to evaluate it from Um, and I learned that, you know, the classes were more of a class of convenience and that he never surpassed shadow boxing or working a heavy bag. Um, grappling, on the other hand, he went from a bag and he was working with a partner, but it's very important to understand the difference between the two concepts because in grappling, you have the opportunity to what we call tap out. You can say, um, you, I quit, I give up, if something hurts too much. In boxing, when you enter a ring with another um, person, you find out you've entered into too much, you know, more than you can handle when you've been punched and injured already. And according to uh, what I learned about Mr. Zimmerman is he didn't have the physical prowess to go into boxing another person. 
shadow boxing and working the heavy bag were the safest parts for him. He wasn't at a skill level that permitted him to physically interact with another boxer. Um, any further information that you became aware of regarding Mr. Zimmerman's physical abilities besides what you've just testified to? No, sir. Just what the gym owner had provided me with and his background from his experience with Mr. Zimmerman. Okay. As to Mr. Martin, I don't want you to discuss any anecdotal information that you may have heard about, but just focusing on um, his physical size, um, age, whatnot, and to the extent that you believe that that was relevant in comparing the physical abilities, if you would give the jury your thoughts on that. Well, looking at phys the physique, this, the overall size of a person is more telling um, about an individual than age. So in my review of it, there was nothing that indicated to me that uh, Mr. Martin wasn't physically capable. You know, when I looked at his size and weight, they were comparable to a, you know, and I, and I saw the photos of him, he seemed to be overall in good physical health and physically fit comparatively to Mr. Zimmerman, who was in the process of losing weight. There was no question he had gained great value in weight loss, but he was not, from what I could see and understood from his physical descriptions, to be of physical prowess or physically fit. You know, and we have to focus, and I even, in the reviewing the documentation provided, the EMT reports and things like that, photos don't tell you everything. That's the, the one thing, is a picture can't tell you everything. So I rely on other sources of information, and I read in the um, discovery that the fire paramedic estimated Mr. Uh, Martin to be 20s. So, you know, his physical, again, that's another resource that I use. I interpret a photograph, but I'm not standing there right next to him. So I use that also as a reference material to get a, a, a generalized idea of the physical physique of another person when using it in comparison to the other party. And what, is your, um, what are your thoughts then on the comparison between the two individuals as far as their physical abilities? Um, Comparing what I know of, to the best of my knowledge, for each individual, um, Mr. Martin was a physically active and capable person. Mr. Zimmerman is an individual who is, by no stretch of the imagination, an athlete, and that his physical, I, I believe it's my opinion that the physical abilities he would find himself lacking when compared to Mr. Martin. Moving on then to the actual event itself and the information that you had available to you as to how it unfolded, we've talked or begun with a conversation about at least Mr. Zimmerman's perspective and the other evidence that you talked about as far as where it started. Um, did you give any consideration to the length of the altercation? Of course I did. I mean, when you talk about any kind of dynamic combat event, when I say that, I'm talking about just in layman's terms of fight. We, we have a, a golden rule that if you have not successfully completed the fight, if you have not won the fight in 30 seconds, change tactics, because the tactics you're using aren't working. The average person's adrenaline dump, um, the endorphins that get pumped in under stress, within 30 seconds you've depleted just about everything you have as far as giving 100% of your physical ability. And if you haven't been able to successfully win the event in the first 30 seconds, you need to change tactics. The reason we, we, we talk about that, that's both in law enforcement and individual, the civilian realms, is when you find yourself in a physical altercation, you only have so much gas in the tank. And you can only do so much based on your background, training, and experience. So the longer the fight takes place, the more fatigued you become, the more potential there is for injury, the, the, everything begins to unravel. I don't ever say that you've lost. All we, we say is you have to change tactics. You have to find another thing because if you haven't physically been able to succeed in the first 30 seconds, from that point forward, you are now diminishing on return physically. In this particular case, just going off you know, the timeline of the 911 call, given the period of time, 
you know, and I've, I personally have sat there and, and timed it myself where it's about 40 seconds of time. That's a very long time to be involved in any kind of physical altercation. And that most certainly plays into the, dis the decision making of any individual involved. Did the um, event um, of someone screaming for help, screaming during the event, did that impact at all on you in how you perceived the altercation? Listening to the, the sounds as it unfolded, it is clear that the, the, what I would call the cries, the shrieks for help, indicated a high level of stress, a high level of fear. That's what I interpreted those screams and those sounds to mean. And how about the length of them, how long they lasted? Uh, it, from my perspective, it lasted forever. You know, when you talk 40 seconds, the average person doesn't truly conceptualize what 40 seconds is. Um, as a taser weapon instructor, we give five second applications of that weapon system to our personnel. And it, without fail, during that time, at the end of that five seconds, they, the, the officer or deputy that's had to endure it will look at you and go, you held it for longer. There's no way that was just five seconds. Because we, we don't truly have the concept of what five seconds is. Imagine what eight times that is, 40 seconds. 40 seconds is an eternity when you're involved in any kind of physical conflict. At some point, you know from the information that um, Mr. Zimmerman discharged his firearm? Yes. Um, when you look at a discharge of a firearm event, is, is this then in the context of what you have done in your training and experience you've talked to us about with officer-involved shootings? Is this something that you'd look at and focus on as to what happens that leads up to the discharge of a firearm and what happens afterwards? Yes. Okay. Um, we've now sort of talked about what leads up to it because I'm now bringing you to the point in time where the firearm is discharged. Was the discharge of the firearm itself, um, the way it was discharged or the number um, instructive at all to you? Well, based on the information that I reviewed in the discovery, I, you know, I concluded that I'm a little unclear me, on the question. Refocus, Can you clarify it? Let me refocus the question. Um, is it your understanding that Mr. Zimmerman shot his firearm once? Yes, one time. Um, is that unusual to, in effect, stop at one? Or in your experience in matters of officer-involved shootings or other shootings that you've looked at, can you offer any insight to the jury regarding that? Did you object to that as um, improper, irrelevant as to any other law enforcement officer in the discharging of their weapon or any other person? For that okay, purpose? that's a speaking objection. Your objection is? Well, it's... Um, I have to sustain on that one. Okay. Um, is anything in the discharge of his firearm, from your view of the event, evidence to you that Mrs. Zimmerman acted in some additional form of fashion of ill will, spite, or hatred, realizing, of course, that the discharge of a firearm at somebody is an event that can cause death. Judge, I'm going to object as improper based on our limiting motion. Okay, if you please approach. Witness accounts may or may not be accurate. That's a good observation, and we'll have to see how the cross-examination plays out, by the way. Back to courtroom 5D. I asked you a question. I want to rephrase it a little bit to focus your answer. Um, I asked you um, <clears throat> whether or not the firing of a single shot evidenced certain ill will or hatred. I want to clarify that a little bit and then just ask you to answer it um, yes or no. Just so we get to that point, but I don't want you to expound too much on that, okay? The modification of my question is this. Looking at the um, fact that the gun was fired at close range, did you know the what premise question you're on? Did you know the gun, did you know how far away approximately the gun was from Mr. Martin when it was fired? Yes. 
And what did you know that to be approximately? Um, if I remember reading correctly, it was within six inches. Okay. Realizing that as a premise question that it was a close range shot and that it was shot one time, did that evidence to you, based upon your training and experience, anything that would suggest ill will, spite, or hatred towards Mr. Martin by Mr. Zimmerman? No. Okay. Now, let's go to the point after the, the shot is fired. Um, in your um, background and training and experience of people involved in shootings, um, how are, as an example, how are law enforcement shootings handled as far as the interview of the person who shot? Well, generally speaking, with law enforcement involved shootings, it's, um, they do a yes, Your Honor, I'm going to object to relevance. I can respond, I just don't want to speak. Well, I, I think if it's to put it into context, yes. I'll give you some leeway. Thank you. Um, and just so we're clear as, as, as to that, the majority of your experience and training is because of your law enforcement background. You deal with law enforcement events, correct? Yes. Have you had experience where you handle non-law enforcement shooting events? Yes. Okay. So do you have an experience level that covers both law enforcement and non-law enforcement shootings? Yes. Is the majority of yours, however, in law enforcement shootings? Yes. By nature of you being a cop? And Yes, and just retired a couple of years ago. Okay. With realizing that, using the complete broad base of your experience, including law enforcement shootings and non-law enforcement shootings, um, what are the concerns that exist with interviewing a person who's been involved in the event of a shooting? Memory issues. Generally speaking, the primary concern is uh, people, when they're involved in a high-stress event, can have what they call critical stress amnesia, or they can have uh, memory, temporary memory holes, I call them, that sometimes it takes up to 72 hours before they truly get their full memory back about everything that took place. And for some, depending on the stress of the event, they may never remember everything that took place. What are the concerns then with interviewing those people within that time period from a law enforcement perspective? Well, the concerns, I think, whether it's law enforcement or anything, I, your primary concerns with conducting the interviews is how accurate the information is going to be. Has the person been able to reconcile and compartmentalize the event itself and start to accept what has taken place so that they can come forward with all the information. And then you, there's always the problem also that what I, if I, I use myself as a reference, if I was involved in a shooting and I gave you a statement, you know, an hour later, and then tomorrow I remember something a little bit differently because my memory is evolving and I'm starting to work through my own personal conflicts, whatever the case might be, I can have a, a varied statement now. And if too much weight is given, depending on the variation, I'm not talking about a completely different change in statements. I'm talking about <coughs> slight changes or modifications. If too much weight's given to a change, now it, the person's expected that, well, now I'm lying. And the, the reality is it may take me some time to form everything back to be able to provide you with an accurate reflection of what took place. Are there procedures that are in place to safeguard against those concerns with law enforcement officers shooting investigations? Just as relevant, Your Honor. I'll rephrase it, just well, to so we're clear. In all of your experience, both law enforcement involved shootings and non-law enforcement involved shootings, um, are there policies or, or best practices that you're aware of as to um, any delay period or time concerns about interviewing um, shooters? Best practice, you want me to tell you what the best practices yes. are? My experiences have been is any kind of delay. You get a, just a generalized statement at the beginning, an overview statement, nothing in depth, and then you wait. And generally speaking, in the law enforcement world, you have attorneys and PBA reps that immediately come in. That's just the general practice that they come in and are present during any subsequent statement that is made. Are there any suggested delays or waiting periods after the event before the law enforcement officer is set for an in-depth evaluation or an interview? 
Well, training regimens indicating like the trainings that I've conducted and I've been to is every time we teach a class, when, when you teach classes on force, you have to always talk to them about, unfortunately, ultimately the use of deadly force. And we always explain to them that, you know, remember, you're not going to remember everything. You could take up to 72 hours before you're going to remember everything. And we always caution law enforcement because they have a high probability of being involved in a conflict like that. We provide them with that guidance right up front because we don't want anyone to misinterpret any statements. So the best practice is always to delay the, the statement itself. Does delaying it tend to then give greater accuracy to the statement when it's eventually given? Yes. Yeah, for the Your Honor, as to outside area of expertise. To the, I'll rephrase it. Thank you. In your experience and in those situations where you've been involved assisting the departments that you've assisted in use of force events and both as a law enforcement officer and also now as a consultant or an expert witness in using that as an experience base, um, um, have you, do you have an opinion concerning whether or not a delay allowing what you talked about to occur and pass uh, results in more accurate and complete statements? It's my opinion that you'll get a better statement from someone. I'm close to being done. I was going to ask for a few minutes. Didn't know if this was a good time for a morning break. Or... Do you need a break? Ladies and gentlemen. Okay. Is that good? Okay, then I'm still going to ask for a minute if I might. Yes, okay. Listening to the testimony of Dennis Root, again, he has been on the stand for about uh, an hour and 15 minutes, and he's talking now about the temporary memory holds. Let's talk uh, about Bill, with that, with Bill Schaefer after Mark O'Meara continues his questioning. a while ago, but I think we've gotten the concept that you are fairly well trained in all areas of weapon systems, including firearms. Yes, sir. And you actually teach other people how to um, handle and utilize firearms. Yes, I conduct uh, individual trainings for everything from basic handgun fundamentals through intermediate, advanced, and um, tactical application of handgun. Do you have an opportunity to identify the type of gun that was used in this case? Yes. The um, Caltech 9? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, can you explain for the jury, based upon your training and experience, the, uh, the appropriateness for use as a self-defense weapon or the lack of appropriateness as that gun is a self-defense weapon? Any firearms, you know, if the individual is willing to carry a firearm for self-protection and willing to do so in accordance, you know, with all the training and backgrounds that should go with it, any firearm is a good selection. It's a matter of selecting the weapon system that's good for you. You know, when it comes to that particular weapon, it's a 9 millimeter. It offers some advantages, some disadvantages, and um, it all depends on the individual because it's a very personal selection when it comes to selecting a firearm for choice as far as self-defense. I'd like you to focus on the safety. Um, we have it available, but I, do you have enough of a working knowledge of the gun to be able to talk about without seeing it? Yes. Okay. Um, and if I might have a little bit of leeway to lead you, it is a weapon that doesn't have an external hammer? Correct. And no external safeties, correct? Correct. Then do you believe that gun to be a safe weapon to carry? Of course. And why? Tell, tell the jury, if you would, what safety, why is it safe, or how do you carry it in a safe way? The most important safety of every single firearm is the person holding it. Because the reality of the modern day manufactured firearm is the only way that the firearm is going to discharge is if you squeeze the trigger all the way to the rear. Uh, a lot of people make um, assumptions based on, you know, because 
like the Berettas and things like that, there are various Smith & Wessons, there's various products available that have external safeties. In other words, you flip the safety to the down position, gun will not function at all. The downside to that when you consider a firearm for personal safety is under high stress events, your brain's not going to remember without a tremendous amount of constant and ongoing training. Your brain's not going to remember that you have to flip the safety up before you can utilize the firearm. Because under stress, you're going to do what you did at the range. You're going to discharge it. So having those external safeties, as a safety person myself, they, don't, they actually create a problem. This particular weapon being uh, double action only, equivalent of double action only, there's no hammer to come back and go forward, but the trigger pull of five pounds or greater means that you have to intentionally put your finger on the trigger to press it all the way to the rear. And it has an internal, so it has a hammer block safety, and the only way to defeat a hammer block safety on any firearm is to press and hold the trigger all the way to the rear. So in and of themselves, you know, a lot of people misconstrue that because there's no external safety, it's not a safe firearm. That's not accurate. A firearm is as safe as the person holding it. So as long as you're not putting your finger on the trigger and squeezing it, it's, it can be a safe weapon. Um, there's a variety of weapons that are manufactured. This particular weapon does have an internal safety, which is a hammer block safety, but it also has, at least from my understanding, now I have not examined this particular firearm, but the Keltec, I believe it's the PF9, has got like a five pound trigger, which is a good standard trigger pull because it makes it hard enough not to just get hung up on clothing, but not so hard that you have to have super grip to be able to discharge the firearm. If there was um, testimony and evidence from firearm experts that the trigger pull was four and a half to four and three quarter pounds, is that in the range of what you're talking about, which is a safe range? Yes, sir. Without taking it to gun manufacturers, I mean, if, if you look at the manufacturers, they say it comes with a specific five-pound trigger. How they're achieving their numbers versus how somebody else is measuring it, I can't. That's beyond my scope for that. There's testimony concerning an internal holster for a concealed weapon. Um, is that in any way an unsafe way to handle or to carry a weapon? Carrying an internal... The idea behind a concealed weapon's permit is you have to keep it concealed. Anytime you take a weapon and put it on the outside of your belt line, that's something a shirt has to cover, a jacket has to cover, and it makes it more difficult. So the most common things that you can find are in what we call in-pant holsters, where they slide inside the, the pants themselves, inside the belt line. Some hook around the belt, some have a clip that hook right onto the pants. Um, the idea is it makes it easier to conceal so that you don't have to have a jacket. You could do it with just a pullover shirt or something to that effect. And it just it doesn't make it an unsafe holster or anything like that. It's a preference issue. If um, in your firearm training, when you train both officers and non-officers, um, is it safe or unsafe to have a round uh, chamber, I guess is the word, you use your word, um, is that the way you should or should not have a gun? And this is like one of those debates from old. Having a round in the chamber means you can discharge the firearm immediately. Not having a round in the chamber means that in a high stress event, you need to remember to work the action on the slide, in other words, pull the slide all the way to rear, let it go, so that it will feed a round. We go right back to the concept of why you don't have external safeties on on a firearm. Under stress, under any type of actual threat, you, don't, you may not have the time to work it, and more importantly, you may not have the memory that, oh, I've got to load one into the round, or a round into the chamber. Carrying it full, magazine full, and one in the chamber is the best way to carry a firearm. Because if you're carrying it for self-defense, if you're carrying it for self-protection, you, well, you have the equivalent of an unloaded weapon when you have a weapon that hasn't been quote-unquote charged. When you take a magazine and stick it inside a firearm, you, the people will tell you, well, you've loaded the gun. That's not exactly completely accurate. You have loaded the magazine and placed it in the weapon, but you have not charged it. Therefore, the weapon is not actually loaded because loaded would indicate that you could pull the trigger and something would happen. If you don't have one in the chamber, you pull the trigger. If it is the hammer is cocked or if it's a Glock or whatever and it's allowed to fall forward, it's falling on empty space, and now you have to work the action of the weapon to get it to work. Carrying it without a round in the chamber, why carry it? 
And uh, you mentioned a moment ago, one in the chamber in a full magazine. Is it appropriate or inappropriate to load it in the chamber and then put the additional bullet that's now been taken out of the magazine back into the magazine so you have a full magazine? Again, I'm, you know, my training and all my experience and what I train people to do is if you're carrying a firearm and it will hold seven rounds in a magazine and one in the chamber or hold 15 in the magazine and one, whatever it will do, load the chamber and make sure the magazine is fully loaded so that you have the full complement of ammunition that that weapon is designed to carry. The, um, in evidence are the bullets themselves that were in the gun, which are hollow point bullets. Um, do you have experience with those? I have experience with the ammunition. I'm not a ballistics expert. No, no, no. I'm just curious, is the hollow point bullet um, an appropriate self-defense bullet to carry, to utilize? Yes. The reason being, when you look at a round nose bullet or something like that, it's you know kind of like what you see in the movies all the time with the big point at the top of the bullet. The problem with that is, is there's a really good chance it won't what we call mushroom. When a bullet impacts soft tissue, its design is to widen out to create a, a better wound channel, but the more important thing is it stops inside the soft tissues. Sometimes it exits, sometimes it doesn't, but the idea behind a hollow point is that there's this center cavity that when it hits, helps it widen out, which means it's less likely to overpenetrate. It's less likely to exit a person. Whereas a round nose round or a wad cutter or you know, a variety of other ammunitions, because they're solid nose, when they hit, depending on how close they are, they can still, the energy is still going, it hasn't mushroomed enough and it may actually exit, which means as a self-defense weapon, your goal is just to deal hopefully with one person and otherwise with the wrong ammunition, it can go through and now you've got to worry about your background being struck by the round that you fired. So in a very um, strange way is the use of a hollow point bullet, um, though it will cause injury to the first person it hits, um, less likely to cause injury to somebody behind the initial target. Yes, because it's less likely to exit the first person that it impacts. Thank you very much, Your Honor, for the questions. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, Mr. Rue, good morning. Morning, sir. Did I hear you to say that your opinion is because the defendant discharged his firearm a single time, that doesn't evidence to you ill will, hatred, spite, or evil intent? Correct. Okay. Did you have an opportunity to listen to the non-emergency call he made just moments before discharging his firearm? Yes. Did you hear him refer to the person he ended up shooting, Trayvon Martin, as an asshole? I sure did, yes. Did you? Didn't know Trayvon Martin, right? I think that that people like to give a little bit too much weight because if you look at it in the context in which it was stated, you know, his reference in that statement was addressing his, frust clearly addressing his frustrations from previous calls in which the individuals got away. His verbiage chosen may not be the most appropriate, but I don't necessarily mean that just because somebody has said that means that, that they mean ill will. But the target of his frustration, you understand, was Trayvon Martin. I would have to say that the comment, in my opinion, the comment, that frustration was being voiced at the fact that he's made numerous calls. The fact that he called, I mean, the other alternative is go, wow, these fellows always get away. I don't know what his general speech pattern is like in regards to how he refers to everybody else. So, you know, in and of itself, I don't see that variable as being showing ill will. All right, well, let me ask you. either one of those terms during your entire conversation geared toward me no sir no, no at all i don't recall if he was asked specifically about that no no in his 
conversation with you, did he say the word asshole? I don't recall if at some point it came up during the conversations about that tape, but as far as the context being used to me, he did not call me that. All right, and did I understand you say that the most important factor about the safety of, the gu uh, of any firearm is the responsibility of the user? Sure. So an irresponsible person can be really, really dangerous. Absolutely. Any person that is reckless with their firearm can be dangerous, sure. I want to talk for a moment about your um, connection with this case. You told the jury that you actually reached out to the defense, right? Correct. And tell the jury when you started your consulting company. That is what you're doing now. I started doing consulting work at the... I want to say it was 2011, 2012, through Tactical Advantage Solutions. In 2013, I started Dennis Root and Associates, which is a private investigations and expert witness firm. Dennis Root and Associates, you started earlier this year? Yes, sir. Okay. You understood when you contacted the defense in this case that this case was getting national, if not worldwide, attention? Of Correct. course. And you understood that uh, there would be live coverage of this trial if you were to testify, right? Yes, sir. And assuming those cameras are working, uh, you're on live television right now, right? As far as I know, yes, sir. And the sir. name of your company is on live television, right? I believe so, yes, sir. So that's good for your company. You would agree with that, right? I see where you're going. It's good for my company, but there wasn't really other options as far as approaching the state in the same way. Well, didn't you think that you being a witness in this case might do your company some good? That is, you'd get your name out there? There is no question that anybody that's seen anything about this case would be aware of the fact that it's getting media coverage. But anybody that does their homework about me knows the fact that I'm dedicated to finding the truth and supporting the truth. When I approached Mr. O'Mara about it, it's because I knew that the state would be able to gain access to somebody just like me with no issue. If I had approached the state about this, and let's say I determined whatever, that it wasn't going to be supportive for the state, or it would be, let's say for just instances that I found that I wouldn't be supportive, I now could not be in any way of assistance to the defense. However, if I reached out to the defense and I provided them with the opportunity and I found that, whoa, wait, I can't be any of assistance to you, I have not hindered the case in any way, and I could walk away without any problems and affecting in either way. So the fact that I gained some kind of media coverage from it isn't my fault because those of us that are dedicated to the truth, those cameras are here, that's not why I'm here. And isn't it true you've advertised the very fact that you are a witness in this case? Yes, sir. You, I mean, you've tweeted that out, right? Tweeted? I haven't tweeted how, it. How, how did you advertise it? Um, when I was put on the case, every attorney that I know knew about it. Um, obviously, in the fields that I go in, the attorneys, just like every other profession, talk. And then just this morning, um, I, let, I texted my friends to let them know that I would be testifying here today. And in fact, you haven't been paid yet, have you? No, sir. Your agreement is you may get paid, you may not, right? That's correct, sir. Okay, but that's not your normal practice, right? Actually, sir, it, 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 depending on the case that comes through, and if you looked at my background, you would know that I've done some things for free. I've done some things for um, some people for $20 an hour, and I've gotten paid up to $175 an hour. I really base it on the case that's presented to me. Right, but didn't you provide me with a, uh, an invoice sheet or, or the way that you bill clients? For the expert witness, sir? Yes, sir. Right. Okay, yes, well, that's what you're doing here today, right? Yes. And it's $1,500 initially, and then $125 an hour after that? Yes. The way it breaks down, basically, is if I'm hired in as an expert, my general fee schedule is there's a $1,500 deposit, and my hourly rate is $125 an hour. That is for case prep and review. Then on the dates that I testify, either by deposition or I testify in court, my hourly rate is 175 an hour, and that includes travel time and wait time. 
And actually, you've never testified before a jury before, have you? Excluding in, in court like this? You mean excluding grand juries? Correct. Yes, this is the first time that I've actually testified before a jury on a criminal case. In an expert capacity, I've testified, obviously, as an officer in a criminal case numerous times. Right. You've testified against police officers, right? Testified against police officers? Yes, sir. I've ha I have been presented with cases that um, I found that the officer was wrong. Yes, sir. And you've testified to that? That one through deposition, not Correct. in trial. Yes, sir. I, I mean under oath. Oh, yes, sir. All right. But you've never testified in a case like this where one person, and I mean in court, where one person shoots another and the shooter is claiming self-defense? No, this was the first time I was ever presented with something like this. And you yourself have never been involved in a police shooting, have you? I'm fortunate enough that no, I've never had to shoot anyone. In fact, you've never had to discharge your firearm in the course of your career, have you? I mean, other than at a range? Right, other than training sessions, scenario-based training, things like that, I've never had to discharge my firearm in the line of duty. And you've never had to use any other type of deadly force in your career, have you? Explain deadly force, sir. I mean, the things that I've had to do to people, I've had caused injuries and things like that. And remember, deadly force just isn't about killing somebody, it's about causing serious bodily injury or death. All right, but you've never caused someone else's death during the course of your career? No, sir. All right. And the first time you got information in this case would have been April of this year? A couple months ago? Do you mean actual case stuff? Yes, if, sir. Oh, yes. Yes. And one of the things you did um, was you interviewed the defendant. I right? did have a conversation with him, yes, sir. And the purpose was to get a first-hand account of what he remembers. Yes, sir. And you would agree with me, would you not, that as a person charged with murder, he would have a motive to fit the facts his way. Sure, anybody, if somebody was guilty of something they wanted to lie, you wouldn't lie to get yourself into trouble. And you listened to the non-emergency call, I believe you testified to that, right? Mr. Zimmerman's yes. not, yes sir. And you heard him describe Trayvon Martin um, in a couple of terms we've already talked about, but also as real suspicious, right? Yes, sir. And up to no good. You remember yes, that? Yes, sir. Yes, You remember sir. him telling the dispatcher that he's got his hands in his waistband? I do recall that, yes, sir. And he told the dispatcher he's got something in his hands, right? I believe he indicated that he thought he might have something. He wasn't sure. I don't believe he actually said he has something in his hands. But you didn't ask the defendant after making those observations if he was concerned when he got out of his car. Well, sir, just to proffer it, you say I didn't ask him anything. You, I don't think you were there no. is what I'm trying to say. Did, did you ask him that specific question? Were I, you concerned for your safety when you got out of the car? No. And I believe um, you'll recall in that phone call that he told the dispatcher that he went to the other side of the T. You're familiar with what I'm talking about. You've I been am. To the scene. Yes, sir. That he went to the other side of the T to get a street address, a house address, right? Told, it, told the dispatcher that? Right. I or, honestly don't recall. Well, how about that. this? Did you watch the walkthrough? Yes, sir. Okay, did he tell those people he went to get a thing? Uh, yes. Address? Okay. But he never, he never did tell the dispatcher a street address, did he? No, sir. As the conversation was concluding, I believe that he just let it rest with have him meet him at his truck, and then it was have him call me, and I'll tell him right where to meet me. Something to that effect. And what was your understanding about the length of time from the defendant between the time he hung up with the dispatcher and the time that he claims he was confronted by Trayvon Martin? It was not that great period of time. Okay, but, but you were interested in that time because you've told us the timeline is important to you, right? Oh, absolutely. But you have to understand that when we make inquiries, and you have to remember that Mr. Zimmerman's statements to me only account for a very small portion of weight that I give to my overall evaluation of the case because just like the gentleman said I can't base it all off somebody that may make self-serving statements but the concept of time that everybody constantly gets hung up on is the fact that whether it's 15 seconds 30 seconds a minute whatever the case might be 
everybody's concept of time is different. So I don't make a huge deal out of what his perception of time would be for this given period. But, but you would agree with me that the only person that you interviewed who had first-hand information from this event, from the start to the finish, was the defendant, right? Yes, sir. He was the only one that I actually spoke to in person outside of Mr. Pollock. I did interview Mr. Pollock, but unfortunately our schedules were such that I had to do it over the phone. I called him and spoke to him over the phone. Right, but I mean, you listened to a bunch of other statements, all your statements by witnesses, right? Oh, absolutely. And you read their written statements, right? Yes. Nobody, nobody other than the defendant had a first-hand account from start to finish, did they? Well, no. There was only one person there that's unfortunately still here with us that can do that. And it, are you aware that it was actually two minutes between the time he hung up with the dispatcher and the time that Trayvon Martin's phone went dead? Are you, were you aware of that fact? Let me object, Your Honor. That would be a mischaracterization of the evidence, though he's allowed. Okay. Um, rephrase your question. Do you know what time Trayvon Martin's phone went dead? Can you explain to me what you mean by went dead, sir? Yeah, when it, when it cut off. When, I mean, did you see the phone records in the case? Yeah, are you referring to when the, the call ended? That's right. Did you see that? I believe, I don't, the phone records from Trayvon Martin's phone. That one I can't, I, I think I saw them, but I don't know that I saw that particular variable in there. I don't want to say that I saw something that I okay. didn't see. Okay, well, you, you thought you were provided everything, right? Yes, sir. Okay, do, do you know whether or not you were provided Trayvon Martin's cell phone records? There were cell phone records there. Um, Again, I did not, the cell phone itself, to me, when I was doing my evaluation, the actual cell phone, I didn't see the weight that it had when evaluating the actual use of force event. So the timeline that's relating to me, I can't speak directly to. All right, did you um, have a testimony of a woman named Rachel Gentel? Rachel Gentel. Young girl yeah. from Miami was on the phone with Trayvon Martin. Your Honor, just not to interrupt, but I don't know if you would know her by that name. So. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm I just... Well, to the extent that that's an objection overruled. Okay, well, let, let, I'll rephrase it. Yes, sir. D did you hear the testimony of the woman who claimed to have been on the phone? Yes, sir. With Trayvon Martin? And did you hear her say in her testimony that the phone went dead shortly after, she, or right after she heard a bump when she was talking to Trayvon Martin? Yes, sir. Okay. And... In creating your timeline, you said timelines are important, right? Yes, sir. Did, did you put together that it was two minutes from the time the defendant hung up with the dispatcher and the time that Trayvon Martin's phone went dead? Using those timelines and, and evaluating on the timelines, there's a lot of questions that that timeline creates. And being able to compare when the dispatcher's phone went, because I'm not really, I can't comment on how they were geosynced or GPS or anything like that for the accuracy of the times, both by the provider and dispatch. But there's a lot of things that even Ms. Gentel said were taking place during that, that time that don't seem to line up either. So I, I want to be very cautious about how I just restrict myself to your timeline for that two minutes when there's other variables that if they played out the way that it was elicited from her would have a different outcome. So I, I just want to be very cautious now I answer you with that. All right. Well, I, I'm not asking you to be cautious or, or, or the opposite. I'm just asking you, did you take note of the fact that there was a two-minute gap between the end of the, each of those calls? I did not give that weight, no, sir. All right. And um, in your conversation with the defendant, he described this whole event to you, right? Yes, sir. Okay, but you didn't have a mark on a diagram um, where he claimed, or, a, or an aerial photograph where he claimed the confrontation began? No, sir. And you didn't have a mark how it progressed from where he claims it started to where it ended? I didn't require Mr. Zimmerman to create any kind of drawings or mark on any kind of pictures or anything. And the defendant did not describe for you from what direction he claimed that Trayvon Martin approached him. I don't recall, as far as the direction, that would have been my failure not to ask. He said he was approached and I didn't specifically ask, was it, you know, if you mean by direction north, south, east, west, that would have been my failure not to ask that. Okay, well, I'm, I'm not talking about uh, geography. I'm talking about front, back, side. I got the impression he approached him from the front. During our conversation, it was pretty clear that he um, approached him from the front.
You didn't ask the defendant what hand Trayvon Martin used to punch him, right? No, sir. You didn't ask him how long it was between the time he got punched, as he claims, and the time he went to the ground. I didn't ask him for specific times, and again, I reference back to what I already said, that when I interview somebody for a force event or if I review a force event, time is so fluid, actually sitting there saying, well, was it five seconds, was it 10 seconds? There's a period of time that took place. It's fluid, it's movement, it's evolving. So the presumption that once it begins, their concept of time becomes less relevant. So I don't lock anyone, anyone, into a specific timeline in that regard. I know, but, but, but the timeline is important to you, right? The overall timeline, yes, sir. Okay, and the defendant didn't describe for you how it was they moved from where he claimed the confrontation started to where they ended up? No. There was no explanation as far as how they transitioned from that. That, that, doesn't, that fact doesn't speak to you about the level of the confrontation? Well, understanding the dynamics of a combat event or a fight, you know, there's a lot of things that spoke to me about what he said and the other witnesses said in this case. And when you evaluate it and look at it, and how did you get from here to here? How did you end up on your back? Why weren't you on top? The evolution of the event itself and the imperative part that becomes bound is when the actual physical confrontation began and when it intensified. Where they transitioned, being in combat events myself, being in fights and knowing that they start here and end up over here, well, how'd you get there? We were tussling, we were struggling. Oh, I apologize. <laughs> uh, we, were, we were involved in this person-to-person -person conflict. How they transitioned from one spot to the other spot, giving there was no major event that took place at that point, I didn't try to narrow them down on a time for that. Okay, but I mean, you didn't ask him, not just time, you didn't ask him how they got there, right? What, what happened in between? The fight started here and it ended up on the ground there. Right. And I did not inquire him. from him specifically how he got from this point to this point. Right, himself. as in whether or not they were rolling over there or whether or not they were fighting standing up over there to get over there, right? Right. I would presume, based on the physical evidence, I wouldn't even presume they were rolling over there. But, you know, whatever the struggle took place, I personally didn't inquire about that. No, sir. Okay. And you were asked um, by the defense counsel um, if you took into account the placement of uh, the defendants, I think it was a key fob with a flashlight on it? Yes, sir. Isn't it true you didn't ask the defendant about his losing personal property throughout this event, where and when he lost things? I did, I, that I don't recall. I can't say honestly whether I asked him that directly or not. I, 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 I don't think I did, but I don't recall specifically, I'll be honest. You didn't ask him how he lost his keys or, 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 or the little flashlight, did you? No, because as far as that point with the way you phrased it like that, I don't know what, you, what you're asking me there. I didn't ask him specifically how you lost your keys. I didn't ask him how he lost his keys. keys. Dropped, right? Well, I saw the photograph and evidence also that there was a picture with that item right there, right by the sidewalk on the grass. Did you ask him how he lost this? And for the record, it states 145? No, sir. Okay. This, um, this, by the way, would that be an impact weapon? M may I hold it? I wouldn't sure. know it's made out of how much of the way. I mean, anything could be an impact weapon. Yes, you could, you could use this to strike somebody. I mean, Absolutely. so you, when you were testifying earlier about your familiarity with impact weapons, that would be one. This most certainly could be used in that form or fashion. Sure. And the defendant um, told you that his head was repeatedly slammed into concrete? His words were, <clears throat> excuse me, his words were his head was slammed into the concrete. Okay, you didn't ask him how many times? No, not how many times it happened. Again, we go back to perceptual distortions. All right, and you didn't ask him how his head was slammed, right? I mean, whether uh, Trayvon Martin grabbed his ears or grabbed his face or grabbed his jacket? No, I didn't ask him specifically how his head was being impacted into the concrete. I, again, generalized statements from Mr. Zimmerman himself because he doesn't account for the overall weight of my opinions. And there are many ways, but the way he related the information, despite there being many ways for his head to contact the concrete, the manner in which he related the information about being struck in the face and his head striking the concrete, there, it could have been during the strikes. 
But her perception was that the downward blows, his head hitting the concrete, his head was being slammed in the concrete. And I even got that from the uh, video that you recommended I watch. His video, right? The one? No, sir. You're the one you mentioned about Hannity. Right. Uh, Sean. I, right. He, yes. he said it then, too, right? Didn't he? Yes, sir. And if you, you know, the verbiage that I looked at there also, again, perceptual distortions is he's being struck in the face and his head striking the concrete. We can put weight to various things. And, you know, as an expert, each and every one of these things in and of themselves may not account for everything. It's the totality of everything. And what caused his head to hit the strike or to strike the concrete, it's clear that his head was in contact with a hard surface based on the injuries on the back of his head. The striking of the face, could that have been what caused him hitting the concrete? Sure. Was he being pushed down? You know, another option is if we think about Mr. Good's statement, is if, because Mr. Good's statement adjusted from when he initially gave his statement, um, if it was not always striking but pushing, if Mr. Zimmerman's trying to rise as he shoved back, even if it was a pushing down motion, could that result in his head striking the concrete? Absolutely. Regardless, from my perspective as an expert looking at it, there's a variety of ways in which his head could have impacted the concrete, but it's clear that he was struck and his head did make contact with the hard surface. Right. And I think you said you reviewed um, some medical records? Yes, sir. Okay. Did, did you review the medical record that, um, where, the, where the woman measured the longest laceration on the back of his head is two centimeters? Um, I don't want to quote the distance, but yes, there was a, they, they weren't that large. Is that what you're asking? Right. Well, two centimeters, right? That's less than an inch. Okay, I'm really not good with that. I okay. gotta be honest with you. you, remember, <laughs> if, if you, you two centimeters, I'll say yes, but if that's less than an inch, I really. I, you remember I the length of the other one? Half a centimeter? Does that sound right? One up and to the left. <coughs> okay, yes, sir. You didn't ask the defendant about whether any blood from his nose got into his eyes or, or his mouth, did you? Well, I didn't need to ask about the blood getting into his eyes because at the time the photographs were taken. Um, they seemed pretty fresh, and there was no blood all around his face. Um, and as far as in his mouth, I didn't ask that, no, sir. And you didn't ask the defendant whether or not he tried to cover his face while this was going on, did you? No, sir. I just merely asked him to tell me what took place. And you didn't ask the defendant whether or not he tried to strike Trayvon Martin? No, I, again, I didn't spend a lot of time asking him a lot of things. The defendant never told you, did he, what he was doing with his hands while this was going on? No, sir. I don't recall him saying anything. You talked about um, vantage point. Yes, sir. You'd agree with me that out of all the people you heard from, either talked to or had written statements or audio statements, the person with the best vantage point would have been the defendant, right? Of, of course. He was there through the entire thing and... He was an active participant. Right. And you would agree that if Trayvon Martin had lived, his vantage point would be important too? Sure, absolutely. The defendant told you in his statement that um, Trayvon Martin was straddling him, right? Yes, sir. And you understood that from the context of your conversation that Trayvon Martin was over the defendant's belly button, right? It was over his waist area. Well, didn't, didn't you say previously the, over his belly button? During our conversation that we had in deposition, and I was actually not provided with a transcript, so I'm just going off memory here. Um, I believe we discussed it and we identified it could be the waist. I mentioned that a high mount, the, it can be over the waist, the bell, but, belly button area. But we also discussed it, and I mentioned that it could be down around the waist, upper thigh area. Would it refresh your recollection to uh, see a transcript of your deposition, since you haven't had one, to um, refresh yourself on what term you used? Sure. Council, page 53. Um, Just would object to the attempted impeachment. He's, he's having him review it first. The question was answered. Uh, he's entitled to show him the deposition as, if it's... If he suggests that he can't answer the question, he doesn't yeah. remember it, he answered it. If the answer is different. Judge, I'm entitled to refresh his recollection. Okay. 
If um, could you please state the, the date and time of the deposition? Yes, ma'am. Um, well, Mr. Root, you will recall it was um, a week ago Saturday, right? Yes. Okay, Saturday, Saturday in the morning? Yes, sir. We all appeared on a conference call? Yes, sir. Okay. And you were under oath at that time? I was. All right, counsel, page 53, lines 10 through 16. Let me just ask you to review those, that highlighted portion and see if that refreshes your memory as to what your understanding was as to where Trayvon Martin was specifically straddled on the defendant. Yes, sir. Okay. Where was it? In the area of his belly button. Very good. Not directly on it. Well, um, by area of belly button, you mean here? No, no, I, I object. I, that he needs to read the entire question. You can do that on your redirect. And, okay. By area of belly button, do you mean here? If, if that's where your navel is, yes, sir. The area is, it's either going to be below that, it's going to be in the area. I wasn't trying to say that it's on his belly button. Sure. Um, you recognize this as being a human type figure, right? <laughs> yes, sir. Okay. Um, it's actually got a belly button, right? It surely does. Does it appear to be anatomically correct? For the belly button, yes, sir. All right. So, as the defendant described it to you, am I. Is this the way he described it, in the area of his belly button? Well, what's really important right now, sir, um, number one, you've got your knees up pretty high in his waist. If you want to slide down just a little bit more so okay. that you're in the air, there you go. Have a squat. I can't see your crotch, but in the area of his belly button. Yes, okay. sir. Well, here's his belly button. Am I oh. in the area? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, by the way, did you have the defendant do this? No, sir. When you talked to him, you didn't have him do that? No, sir. Okay. If, um, if this person, this mannequin, were carrying a firearm on their waist, where would the gun be right now in relation to me? Would be at your left inner thigh. Right here, right? Yes. If he was right-handed, it would be at your left inner thigh. Yes, sir. Right. Underneath my leg. Yes, inside your leg. Okay. Were you aware that the defendant described to his best friend that um, when he slid down, the defendant slid down, that uh, Trayvon Martin was up around his armpits? Were you aware of that? No, I've not heard that. No, sir. Okay, well, where would the gun be now? Now the gun would be um, behind your left leg. Okay. The defendant did tell you, though, as well that at some point he slid down um, further between Trayvon Martin's legs. Yes, he did indicate that he was sliding down, and I believe that's how the uh, jacket came up exposing the firearm. how he was able to get his firearm, did you? No, sir. He explained that he reached down and grabbed it. But he also explained that Trayvon Martin was in the area of his belly button, right? At, yes, at one point. It, right. The whole thing's fluid, so it's not like Trayvon right. just got in one spot. He moved all around and he, he it didn't move. He said at first he was in the area of his belly button, and then he actually slid down. That, that happened after, right? Yes. And, that, and then he said that's when he grabbed his gun. Yes, after he had slid down, the jacket came up. You're implying that Trayvon didn't move so that it wouldn't be accessible, but we have to remember in a dynamic event, it's not just one person doing all the movements, so we have to take into account both sides of the equation as it's interacting. Well, did the defendant tell you that Trayvon Martin slid down? He didn't do that, did he? No, sir. Um, you, you were asked if you reviewed the medical examiner's report. Yes, sir. You did? Yes, sir. Do you remember 
um, the trajectory of the bullet being referenced in there at being at 90 degrees? Yes, sir, and I believe front to back. Right. Wouldn't that be consistent with Trayvon Martin getting off of George Zimmerman and George Zimmerman raising the gun and firing it? Well, when you talk about angles of anything, sir, it could be consistent with any kind of movement. We could say it could happen that way, it could happen another way. There are various ways that you could have it happen, and, you know, you weren't there, I, weren't, I wasn't there, so the information that we have is what Mr. Defendant, right? That's correct, sir. Okay. I mean, your information came from the defendant. Not all of it, sir. Your, well, your indication is that the only person I spoke with is the defendant, and that's not accurate. I'm talking at the time the shot was fired. The time the shot was fired, the information that I culminated on opinion on that, that is a culmination of everything. The only person that could provide any insight into at that very second that was there was Mr. Zimmerman. Okay. <laughs> and he said he was in the waste area, and then the defendant may have, or, or Trayvon Martin may have slid down. And my question to you is, would it be consistent, the 90 degrees, if Trayvon Martin had been backing up and the defendant raised his gun and shot at 90 degrees? With you at that angle, 90 degrees to what, sir? When you talk about 90 degrees, we're talking about right. this degree. Right. So if it's front to back 90 degrees and you're standing there and you're holding the gun up, already you're at least 45 degrees where you are because he's laying flat on the ground. Right, but if Trayvon Martin, one at a time, just slow down. Just slow down. I apologize. If Trayvon Martin's backing up, could not the defendant have shot him at a 90 degree angle? If Trayvon Martin is backing up. Correct. And you're saying that Mr. Zimmerman is laying on his back, and he brings the gun to bear on Trayvon. If he's backing up, that now that suddenly that bullet's going to go straight in, back front to back. I'm at asking you, could he, could he shoot him at a 90 degree angle? I think I'm getting really lost in uh, this 90 degree thing. Is really I don't want to misinform the jury with my answer. Okay. Well, 90 degrees was what you read in the medical examiner's report. That's right? correct. And my interpretation was 90 degrees front to back was like it was a. For lack of a better word, my interpret I'm not a medical examiner, but my interpretation of the information provided was that it would give it a front to back, for lack of layman's terms, like a level entry, right. not an angled entry. Right. So as this event is transitioning and you're coming back, if this comes back, then we maintain that. Right. If it's a struggle that's forward, so in your 90 degree reference, I want to be very clear that I'm not trying to say that the manner in which you're demonstrating visually right there with him raising his gun up with you sitting back, I don't know how you could get a 90 degree entry if you're sitting straight back like this. Well, I'm not sitting straight back. I'm just... Uh, it, I, I, um, from my perspective is all I'm trying to say, sir, okay. is it looks like you're more vertically upright and he's sort of like the two of you form a 90. Right. And if the two of you form a 90 where you're straight up and he brings the gun to bear just based on the, his, the, the dynamics of his arm, there wouldn't be a way for it to go straight in. There has to be mutual movement to keep them within right. line. As in, if the defendant started to sit up and Trayvon Martin was getting up, are you saying that there couldn't be a 90 degree angle? Am I saying there couldn't be a right. 90 degree angle with right. him in a half up position right. and you trying to get up? If the bodies become in line, it's as long as, in order for my understanding to maintain the entry, we're gonna have to maintain some relativity between the two persons. Right? right? So the relativity, I can sit here and say the same thing that if I'm laying completely back and you're more forward, I can get a 90 degree entry. If we're both coming up, you're asking me to bring up inclusion. Could it happen that way? The answer is absolutely yes. If he's getting up and he's getting up together, sure. We, there's no way I can sit here and say that, no, you couldn't have two people that are maintaining alignment not have that entry. And you were also provided the um, firearms report, right? And you learned that it was a contact wound with the clothing that Trayvon Martin had on? Yes, sir, the clothing. But it wasn't a contact wound with his chest? Correct. So that would be consistent with Trayvon Martin leaning over when he got shot? Yes, right? sir, sure. Okay. asked, um, or you actually spoke a little bit about uh, the lighting, right? Yes, sir. Did you, um, you, you actually went to the scene for the purpose 
of getting idea of the lighting, right? Yes, sir. But you didn't get an idea of the lighting, did you? No, I failed to go take into account the change in season. So when I got there, it was still daylight or dusk area. And, and when, was, I, when was that? Off the top of my head, I can't remember the exact day, sir. I, I, I think I might have told you in deposition, but I don't remember exactly. Could you ballpark it? Was, it? was it in July? July, no. Was it in June? Maybe early June. I, I really, I don't remember the exact date in which I attempted so, that. So you went to the scene to try to get an idea of the lighting, and yes, the sun sir. had not gone down. Correct. It was not completely set. Right. So you, you didn't wait until it had set? No, sir. And you didn't go back? No. When it, when it was dark some other day? No. Um, the defendant told you that uh, Trayvon Martin reached across his body to, to try to get the gun? He mentioned that, yes, sir. But he never told you that Trayvon Martin actually touched the gun? I don't know. I don't believe he said he actually touched the gun. He felt him moving toward the gun. He perceived that he was moving toward the gun. Were, were you aware that the defendant told his best friend that Trayvon Martin actually touched the gun, grabbed it? It's possible he said that. I'm... I mean, did you, you don't... Re I don't think it would affect, I mean, whether you're reaching for it or grabbing it. I'm just asking, you, to do that the Mark other. Osterman, does that name sound familiar? Yes, did, sir. Did you review his testimony or his statements, pretrial statements? I reviewed his statements, but I focused in on the people that actually had witness accounts. Again, my job as an expert is to look at the event not hearsay that comes from somebody else that they're saying, because one, number one, dealing with man on, man to man, I have always got a concern that there, I haven't met too many men whose egos don't enter into it when they're having a conversation with somebody. It's usually generally women that can keep their composure and, and not feel like they're, you know, have to say something that makes another guy feel better about them. But the statements I focused in on were the, the events that took place there, not 110% what somebody else said they heard somebody say. But, but part of your focus, a good part of your focus, was the only witness who could tell you from start to finish, and that was the defendant, right? No. The totality of the event. Again, you're trying to narrow it down, and it's, it's interesting because we could narrow it down to any specific part that you'd like, not just the one part that seems to be advantageous. When we look at the totality of the event, I overlooked or I reviewed everything from everybody that can provide information about the event itself. It is true, the only person currently that we can gain information from that specifically can address the event that unfolded away from the calls and away from the one person is Mr. Zimmerman. Was Not Mr. Osterman or anybody else, just Mr. Zimmerman. Was your conversation with the defendant important? Of course it's important, okay. sir. So wouldn't his statements to someone else about the exact same event also be important? Um, you know, sir, I've listened to the statements related by other people and it always comes back down to the fishing story that even though somebody may want to be supportive, the human element, the human mind, likes to fill in the blanks. It's a natural human thing that we see something, and if we don't understand it, we will, the creative side of our brains will help us fill it in. They will find a way. And that is another reason why if you wait too long and you allow people to get too many interactions with other people, the statements can change because now they have outside influences. As far as what he said to somebody else bringing in is adding like more importance to me at that point, that would be inaccurate because the information I need is about that night, not somebody else's interpretation about what somebody else said. And you talked about um, the use of force uh, continuum, right? Yes, sir. And that's, explain that for the jury what that is. Like I said, it's a force continuum. It's a systematics approach to escalation and de-escalation of force taking into consideration background training experience, weapons availability, and the totality of an event. It's basically saying that if X happens, you can respond with Y. It's right. the, the idea is to give an objectively reasonable connection between two behaviors. And if Trayvon Martin was backing up, as I demonstrated a moment ago, that would be a de-escalation of force, right? Sure, if a person is disengaging, it would be a de-escalation. 
to, right. as long as they're not disengaging to go to another weapon, but right. just in general terms, like you mentioned, of backing away, if I was giving up, that's a de-escalation. You also mentioned um, in the force continuum there are options, right? Yes, sir. Okay, and you would agree with me that someone in the defendant's position had other options. I would disagree with you, sir. You're, you're, you're telling me that somebody in the defendant's position, the moment that perception became a deadly force encounter, the only option that's justifiable would be that, would be the actual application of that level of force. You're, I mean, we can sit here all day long and come up with a thousand things that may have been able to be done, but the reality comes back to what a person is perceiving to be their reality and what the approved responses are for that given reality. Okay, but you don't know what was in his head, do you? Based solely on the information that I re reviewed, based on what I heard from the 911 calls, based on the inclusion of the physical evidence of the injuries to his face and his, the back of his head, and the fact that, in my opinion, most of that information meshes together. So I can draw my opinion and I can come to the conclusion of what I believe the perception to be. And based on that perception, I know what a generalized outcome could or should be. All right, when you said 911 call, you talking about the one with the screams on it? Yes, sir. Okay, you're not telling this jury that, that George Zimmerman's the one screaming, are you? I'm, I'm not telling the jury anything other than what I just told you. If you take into consideration the 911 call, you mentioned whether it was him or not. I wasn't there, I couldn't tell you that. I can tell you that based on Mr. Good's statements, that he believed that the, the screams for help were coming from the gentleman on the bottom, otherwise he would have heard an echoing sound because it wasn't facing away from him. And if you take that concept and you include it in, then it would fall on the play that those screams were Mr. Zimmerman. But in the same token, if you're on top trying to hold somebody down to disengage, as you've indicated, I'm trying to get away from him, and somebody now is coming out saying, hey, stop, and there's no indication from you as the person on top trying to hold somebody back that you need help, and that your inference is that those screams were his help, why was there no acknowledgement of the person behind him? So again, any one of these things in and of themselves don't tell the whole story. It's about taking all of the information and, and considering all of the components and coming to a conclusion. Well, let me ask you this. In, in your experience, if Trayvon Martin or anyone would have been in that situation and would have been aware of the defendant's gun, either seen it or felt it, would you expect them to scream for help? You're asking me if somebody saw, if I am beating the crud out of you and I suddenly know you have a gun, would I expect me to be screaming for help? Would, would that be unusual for a person um, who saw a gun too? If no, I am, you just said if I was Trayvon Martin in that situation and we take it to the place that we've gone with the physical evidence where I'm the aggressor, I'm on you and suddenly I see you have a gun, my first instinct as the aggressor is not going to be to scream for help. My first instinct as the aggressor, if I'm the one that's being the aggressor, is to go for the weapon that's going to help me continue my aggression, not prevent it from being implemented to stop me. Okay, my question was, it would be unusual for a person who saw someone that they were in combat with with a firearm, would it be unusual for that person to yell for help in your experience? I want to make sure I'm clear because you just said, would it be unusual for a person involved in a combat situation to suddenly see a gun and scream for help? Is that the question that you, I want to make sure I'm very clear on because I don't want to misinterpret this because I don't, what I'm going to, I want to be careful on what I say with what you're asking. I'm trying to make it more simple. I mean, if a person sees a firearm, would it be unusual for them to yell for help? If an average individual saw a gun and it was pointed at them, I would say absolutely not. Anybody looking down the barrel of a firearm, if you're able to vocalize something, would probably yell for help. I mean, if you're looking down the barrel of a gun, you would, I would hope if you're looking down the barrel of a gun, you'd be in fear for your life. All right, back to the options. Um, you know, we kind of got away from that. There are other options that George Zimmerman could have used to get out of that situation, right? Based on my understanding of his physical skills and things, he wasn't physically trained you know, asking of options, we go back to what we talk about for subject factors, variables involved in an individual in the event. 
what's your background, training, and experience? You know, one of the training instructor certifications I have is in one-on-one -on -one control tactics, and that is a ground fighting discipline. So yes, there's a lot of options that are available, but if I have no background training or experience to lead me down those paths, there's nothing else. So I am very limited on options. There are always options in every force event. It's just a matter of what you as an individual see as being your options. All right, but the defendant didn't use any other options, did he, other than pulling out the gun? Well, I mean, if we go down the path where he was the one vocalizing, he did scream for help. He elicited assistance from other people. There were other options. He obviously continued to try to resist. He was doing as, you know, the, the I guess they refer to as the shrimping technique, trying to get and move around. I, you know, as far as drawing a conclusion, I don't know what else he could have done based on his abilities. Because, not to be offensive to Mr. Zimmerman, but there doesn't seem to have any. You're not suggesting that the defendant was just laying there getting hit, right? And Absolutely he not. No, he would sir. Have been himself. I would presume that at, at a minimum he would be struggling in some form or fashion to create some kind of gap or distance. Instinctually, that seems like it would just be a normal thing. Um, did you say that there's a verbal component to the use of force? Absolutely. Like telling someone who you are? Well, the verbal component is anytime you interact with people, you can escalate or de-escalate an, an issue based on communication. If I, you know, the levels that when we speak about law enforcement, you have presence and they offer different levels of resistance for us, it would be, um, you know, you tell them, stand over here. No, I'm not doing that. Well, that's verbal resistance. That's a verbal communication. The officer's response can be verbal, which would be, you're under arrest, come stand over here, blah, blah, blah. In the individual or civilian realm, verbalization can be screaming for help. It can be telling the person, no, stop, don't, whatever those cases might be. That's the verbal component. And it, all, it also could be like telling them who you are. Like I'm a resident here. I'm, sure. I'm a neighborhood watch person. Ab ab absolutely. You could tell them that I'm Dennis Root and I'm here to say hello. And you could tell them what your purpose is, right? Like I'm a neighborhood watch person and uh, I, I, I'd like to know what you're doing. Yes, yeah. If, if you're forward of the ability to, to communicate with somebody, it's always a good idea to introduce yourself and advise yeah. them. About I mean, you would do that before using force, right? Well, sir, again, you're asking me what I would do, and I can tell you this. There's a lot of things that if I was in that same situation, I most certainly would have done differently. But the reality still comes down to when you say that somebody that's based on, again, going off 911 calls, this gap, whatever it happens to be, he's in an environment, he's doing what, I mean, the golden rule of community-oriented type programs is if you see something, say something. That's the whole idea. You know, and Mr. Zimmerman has a history of that. He reported, you know, by the calls, everything. He's had numerous calls from a variety of reasons, from children to suspicious persons. The interaction component, is he responsible for when you walk up to somebody and if they're in a suspicious area, hey, I'm a crime watch person, if you have the distance and ability and that comes to mind, that's fine. But that also takes training and, and thought on the forefront. However, on the other side of that coin, if I'm suddenly surprised by something, communication may not be the first thing that comes to my mind, especially if it's a blind side of some type. You did talk to Adam Pollock, right? I did, sir. And you actually talked to the defendant about um, some of those classes, right? Yes, sir. But you didn't ask the defendant how long he had been taking those classes? No, sir. And you would agree with me that should have been asked? No, sir. Did you not say that not getting that information was a failure on your part? Yes, and as I would say anything, just like I did about asking the other thing, anything I don't ask, I always take on as my responsibility. It doesn't change the outcome of an event. It doesn't change the total influence. The fact remains that if he had been spending three years and was just barely able to get into a grappling ring with somebody where he can say uncle, and he spent three years boxing and he can't even get a ring with another person, it really is a moot point about how long he's been doing it. The end result is I got the information from the source that actually can give me a neutral opinion because he was the one doing the training. Because the defendant's not neutral? Sir, just like we said, and you said it yourself, you have to take it with a grain of salt. The only way that I can come up to a neutral opinion on anything is by giving minimal weight to Mr. Zimmerman and trying to find the information from some other source. 
Unfortunately, depending on the variable that we're asking, the only source may be Mr. Zimmerman, but sources that I can get information for from somewhere else other than the defendant, I would seek that because that gives me more possibility of getting the truth rather than what some quote unquote defendant wants me to hear. All right, so you didn't ask him how, for how long he had been taking the classes, like over a year, you didn't ask him? No, sir. You didn't ask him how long each class was, like two hours? Generally speaking, when you look at any of the combative sports, you're looking at an hour and a half to two hours because of warm up, stretching, the actual um, activities, cool down, and stretching again. So I probably didn't ask that only because the general guidance on that for just physical technique type classes, that seems to be the norm. And you talked a little bit about um, Trayvon Martin. You wanted to know about his physical ability, right? I would love to have known totally about it, yes, sir. But you said, yeah, I believe your words were he was physically active. That was my understanding, yes, sir. Because you had information that in middle school, he played football. Again, and I believe I even said it, you know, before this case began, there was information in the media. Your Honor, um, we approach for a moment? Yes. Back to courtroom 5D. Sir, I believe you testified on direct that you were told that he played football in middle school. Is that right? Yes, you, yes, sir. Right. And you had his height and weight, correct? Yes, sir. 5'11 and 158 pounds. Yes, sir. You got that from the autopsy report? Yes, sir. Just a moment. Yes, you may. You were asked questions about um, basic certifications for various weapons, right? Yes, sir. And you're aware that the defendant had a concealed weapons permit? Yes, sir. So he would have taken a course for that? Yes, sir. Isn't a person who is uh, licensed to carry a concealed firearm supposed to disclose that to the police when they talk to him? There's no law about it. I mean, aren't, aren't, aren't they advised to do that when you speak to law enforcement? You're advising that you're armed? You mean in person? I mean over the phone, in person at the, all? Not over the phone. Whenever you interact with a police officer, if you're carrying a concealed weapon, obviously, traffic stop, interaction on the street, something to that effect, we tell everyone that when you interact with law enforcement, the first thing you want to do is make sure your hands are clearly visible and just let them know that you have a concealed weapons permit and you are carrying a firearm. Um, we don't really ever address something over the phone. I mean, sure, I guess it would be nice, but you, you don't said, it. Well, to be clear, the defendant did not advise the dispatcher that he was carrying a firearm. No. And you, you said that you have a criminal justice degree, correct? Yes, sir. Were you taught the law of self-defense in any of those courses? I've taught a lot of laws, yes, sir. I'm sure we covered that. Were you taught fact scenarios that constituted self-defense? I, I can't say that we were caught fact scenarios, every instructor that's responsible for relating information relates it differently in every class. I can't speak to how everybody does it. I know how I relate the information, but I can't speak to how everybody else does. And it was your opinion that a weapon was not used on the defendant? I didn't see, are you talking about Mr. Zimmerman? There was no weapon used on Mr. Zimmerman by Mr. Martin? I believe that's I, what you said. Yes, I, I don't, I didn't see any indication that a, a weapon of any type was used on him. Right. You did see an indication that a weapon was used on Trayvon Martin? Did I see? Did you see an indication that a weapon of was course, used on he, Trayvon Martin? he was shot, yes sir. You know, I have just a moment. Mr. Root, in listening to 
the non-emergency call in your conversation with the defendant, he told you he was following Trayvon Martin. I think the term that he used was trailing, which to me, it means following. I mean, well, it's the same thing. Okay, I mean, do you remember when Sean Nofke, the dispatcher, asked him, are you following him and the defendant said, Oh, yes, sir, absolutely. And the 911 call, absolutely. He asked him, are you following him? He said, we don't need you to do that. Um, did you read the defendant's <laughs> written statement? I'm sure I would have. It was, I, I can't it was about recall. four pages handwritten. I am confident I did. I just don't recall exactly what he had written. I mean, if you ask me a question about it, if I don't know, I'll honestly tell you. I just, okay. I've read so many of the documents. It's. I understand. Do you recall the term that the defendant used to refer to Trayvon Martin in that written statement? No, that I honestly, I don't recall the term that. You don't recall the term suspect? Okay. I don't directly recall it, but I would take your word that he wrote suspect there. Right. You would agree with me that that's a police term, right? Oh, that's, sure. It's a, it's a term that we, it's also a crime prevention term also. It's anybody that you interact with. Um, they utilize the same verbiage, even though you may not get it. it. Most certainly, it's like saying civilian, and I get yelled at by a friend of mine because it's individual. But in law enforcement term, every individual is a civilian. So for suspect, we refer to as being the other person, the bad guy. All right. Judge, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Yes, Your Honor. So I'm clear. Would you consider a big old piece of concrete a weapon if I hit you on the head with it? you hit me in the head with concrete? Yes, I would. How about if I just took your head and smashed it onto concrete? May I use your dog for a moment? Of course. Let's just use this for a moment because I want to follow up on some of Mr. Guy's questions. So, George Zimmerman, Trayvon Martin. Were the injuries on Mr. Zimmerman's back of his head consistent with someone doing this on cement? I, I don't think so. How about this? How about somebody resisting the attempt, the injuries, the two lacerations? Could that have come from cement? If somebody was resisting me pushing down like I, this? I, I believe so. I believe it was a culmination of downward force, whether it was from pushing or striking. Okay. And I know clearly by the injuries to his face, and that driv would drive him back, his head striking hard into the concrete. Would you expect, based upon your training and experience, that somebody getting their head struck on the cement would attempt to resist it happening? Uh, they, of course, they would, you know, normal human instinct would try to move away from the pain stimulus, which would just create a, another gap to be driven back. And, and would that occur not only the first time, but every subsequent time? Every, if, whether it's a push or a strike, every time you blow, drive a strike or push straight downward, the body goes until it hits a, an object that'll stop it. Did you see the um, pictures of the injuries that showed punctate bruising and, and lacerations on the side of Mrs. Zimmerman's head? Those were the, when I said rain, blows raining down earlier, you know, that those were the things that really caught my eye that supported the fact that it was a striking and not a pushing so much because of all of the lack of a better word, injury or damage that I saw on the side of the head. There's swelling all around his head. It's not just the facial area, it's all around the front well, of the head. Those injuries consistent with somebody pushing your head down to the side. You see me move it to the side like that. Is that similar to that hitting cement? It, it could be. It could be that or it could be punches as well, driving those strikes in. And then on the other side, would the, the injuries consist in hitting it down on the side on the left side of Mr. Zimmerman? It could be, and you, you know, and just like uh, Mr. Guy pointed out, if Mr. Zimmerman is on the bottom and he's not just laying there, he is moving, whether he's trying to defend himself, trying to do his, his sliding techniques or whatever they are, as he's turning his body or his head in those efforts, it's going to redirect and realign, so whatever push or punch comes in next, if he's turned this way, it's going to be a strike to a side, the front. That's all indicative of an ongoing combat event. Now, talking about the angle, Mr. Guy, I think, was suggesting that we need to stay focused with the angle of entry of the wound being basically 90 degrees, so it's straight in, correct? That's what he said, yes. Now, that could happen, of course, as Mrs. Mr. Guy suggested, maybe something like this, if Mrs. 
Trayvon Martin is trying to now back away at the end of the 45 seconds of screaming, correct? Correct. Uh, do you agree that that's a possibility? Uh, absolutely, it's a possibility. Do you have any evidence that beyond a reasonable doubt that is what happened? No. Could it happen this way? Yes. At the same angle. Could it happen yes. this way? Yes. Could it happen if Mr. Martin is reaching back with his hand for yet the final strike or something like that? Could it happen right there when he's coming back over? As long as the alignments of the body stay within those same relative positions, where they are within that axis of movement, it's a possibility. Now, you know that Mr. Zimmerman was, in fact, able to get his gun out of the right side hip, correct? Yes. Now, somehow he got to that, correct? Correct. Do you, how much weight do you give to Mr. Zimmerman's ability to disclose and to advise exactly how that happened? Not a lot. Why not? Because when he became aware of the presence of the, the firearm, um, he reached for it. He, the Mr. transition under stress, the transition of how it got into the hand is kind of moot. And, you know, my background, training, and experience, I've interviewed numerous police officers involved in shootings. And frequently I hear, I, I shot, well, when you draw, they're not clear on how they got into position. They just know they did it. Instinctually, survival mechanism, whatever it is, the point still remains, the gun was in his hand, and he did, in fact, discharge it. And he discharged it in a way that was in contact with billowing clothing that was two to four inches away from his chest, correct? Correct, which, you know, when we think about the movements, if he's moving with the, I think it was an Arizona iced tea in his jacket, the, the hoodie, transitioning, leaning forward, if that body position is there, that T is going to keep it away as they transition back. If he's leaned, at some point leaning too far back or whatever, trying to get up, that T is going to be pushing the shirt the opposite direction because it's going with the motion too. At what point and where they were, I can't specifically say. Okay. In the context of your training experiences, the way combat events and how they occur, is it possible that at some point Mr. Martin was in fact up here? There's, there's no question that it's possible because and during the event, when he says he's sliding down, I don't expect Mr. Martin to be able to match him move for move. Is it possible that at some point he was up on his chest? Yes. Okay. Is, you know, then he slides back. And is it possible that at some point he was here? Sure. And how about is it possible that at some point during that dynamic altercation he was even this far down? It's possible. When he's this far down, just over the thighs, where is that hip holster? I'm not going to ask you to get up. Just tell me when to stop my finger as to where the hip holster stop. is. Right here. Yes, sir. Available right to Mr. Zimmerman at that point. Yes, sir. Is it available to him at this point? Yes, sir. How about up here? Yes, sir. What I... is my, at this point, where you say it's available, what is my tie pointing down towards? Can His you belly button. My tie is pointing directly to the belly button? Yes, sir. Based upon your training experience, was there just how much thrashing or movement was happening in that dynamic event between these two men at that point? I would have to say a lot. Was that evidenced by the, the contusions and abrasions on Mrs. Zimmerman's head? Yes, sir. In the clothing, showing the contact, the wet spots on the clothing. You know, I think that you're not going to be involved in an encounter like this without it being dynamic. Speaking of weapons that are available, we had talked about mass the first witness for a moment. Do you consider that this could be a weapon? Yes, sir. Could be a weapon? Yes, sir. Could be a weapon? Yes, sir. Okay. Most anything that you want to be a weapon could be a weapon, correct? Yes, sir. I do training classes on improvised weapon systems. Anything can be utilized. Depends on how it's used. You certainly agree that fists can be weapons, right? Uh, uh, most definitely. Okay. And you saw evidence of injuries caused by the weapon of a fist, right? Yes. And the weapon of concrete? Yes, his head striking the concrete, okay. yes. And just so we're clear, did you see any evidence of any injury on Trayvon Martin from your review of the autopsy that was consistent with him being hit? by this? I didn't see anything to that effect, no sir. Did you see any evidence of any injuries of Trayvon Martin being hit by anything? I didn't note any injuries on Trayvon Martin except for there was the one 
point on his hand. How, how do you explain that fact to this jury? How do you explain the fact that in an ongoing altercation, I'm going to presume for the point of this conversation that it was Mr. Zimmerman screaming, just for this. Yes, and it was Mr. Zimmerman screaming for 40 seconds. How do you explain to this jury that he couldn't even land a strike in defense of himself? Well, if he... I don't object to that. It's called for speculation. You're, not going to ask to You're asking for an explanation? I am, and the door has, I think, been open as to potentialities of what happened between the two that night okay. by Mr. Guy. I'll roll. Can you restate the question again? Sure. I'm sorry. Can you explain to the jury a, a couple of facts? I'm going to suggest that it was Mr. Zimmerman screaming, and you've now testified that Mr. Zimmerman was not able to strike nary a blow on Mr. Mr. Martin. Can you explain to the jury how that might have happened, how that occurred? Well, if we're saying that he's the individual screaming, then we could conclude that with Mr. Martin on top of him, Mr. Martin was the aggressor, the strikes were being rained down, and he, for lack of better words, was physically incapable of responding, screaming for help, wanting somebody else to help him out of a very bad situation. And it's possible that his hands were busy. They were, you know, maybe they were pushing. You know, I wasn't there, so I can't say exactly what his hands were doing. But I know that if you're the aggressor in a fight, there, you know, how can you be the aggressor and not hurt somebody? So in this situation, if he's the one screaming, the reason that there's an absence of injuries is because he wasn't the one throwing strikes. Is it unusual for someone to simply be completely dominated by another one who is physically better abilitied? It all goes back to mindset. And it's not unusual, but what really, you know, in, in listening to the non-emergency call that Mr. Zimmerman made, then it's clear during his conversation that he becomes concerned about Mr. Martin, especially when he's looking at him and walking back toward him, because he even vocalizes this to the dispatcher. He, he didn't get out of the car at that point to confront him. To me, my perspective is because Mr. Martin is not the I'm-in-your-face confrontational person. When he had the opportunity where he mentioned that um, Mr. Martin had taken off running, or I'm sorry, Mr. Zimmerman's not confrontational, when Mr. Martin had taken off, you know, and he announced that they took off running, if that's when he gets out and he, you know, is following and the, the, the operator asks, are you following me? He says, yes, I am. It's because there's no threat. He took off running. Everything about that one call that leads up indicates that he had concern about his safety. I can hear it in his voice. Then when he interacts with him and he's coming back and he's face to face with somebody, he's not confrontational. He's looking at me. He starts talking about trying, and you can hear it in the voice that he's talking to the dispatcher. And then when Mr. Martin's leaving again, suddenly his vernaculars strengthen and he struck me as the type of person that doesn't have a problem telling you that somebody's a jerk, but he doesn't want to tell them that. So. I actually lost the question. I'm sorry. That's, that's okay. I I'll apologize. I know I was going somewhere. I just don't you remember were. where it was. I was just going to let you go, but we'll Thanks. refocus it. Um, let's start where I was going to. Okay. Let me ask you a question. Um, we have plans for the jury to go out for lunch, and I, it's going to take an extra long lunch time. Is this a good breaking? It is wrong. Thank you. Thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, if you'll, before, as you're packing up your stuff, I'm going to remind you that you're not to, to discuss the case amongst yourselves or with anybody else. You're not to read or listen to any radio, television, or newspaper reports about the case. You're not to use any type of an electronic device to get on the internet to do an independent research about the case, people, places, things, or terminology. And finally, you're not to read or create any tweets, emails, text messages, or social networking pages about the case. Do you, well, I have your assurance that you'll abide by these instructions. Yes. Okay, with that, put your notepads down, follow Deputy Jarvis, enjoy your lunch. We'll be back at um, 1.45. Please be seated.
noted, um, Mr. Root, during the lunch hour, you're free to go about your own business, but you are not free to talk to anybody about your testimony. That includes the lawyers, okay? We'll see you back at 145. Is there anything we need to take up before we recess for lunch? Uh, there you are. There are a few things that we have stipulations for entry, but I can do that at any point during my case. Okay. Maybe when we get back or afterwards. That will work. Thank you. Court is in recess. Greg Warmoth along with WFTV legal analyst Bill Schaefer. Again, it looked like.